You okay? There we go. Now I'm on. Now I'm on. So, all right. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you that are enjoying the carrot cake oatmeal and the orange cranberry biscuit with orange cranberry butter. I'm in an orange mood today. So we're having orange. All right. So glad to have you here. Hey, Caleb, you know what? While the um, oatmeal is cooking, we could... No, nah, never mind. I don't want to throw that off of you. I was going to say you could... So, Oh, yeah, I was going to say, you could do the zucchini muffins to those that didn't get the oatmeal. And they're like, yeah, come on. <laughs> We've got a way. We'll get you. We'll get you covered. So how many of you have never been to the Bread Beckers before? Any first timers? Wow, welcome. I'm so glad. Oh, you're not a first timer. Okay, that's all right. She's like, I am. She just thought I was giving away something. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants something free? <laughs> I'm just joking with you. So glad to have you here. Those of you that, huh? Sir, first time canning and, and dehydrating. Okay. How many of you have never been to a cooking class before? Okay. All right. All right. Well, good. You're in for a treat, I hope. <laughs> could be good, could be bad. You just never know. So anyway, um, I'm Sue Becker, one of the owners here and the teachers of, of some of the classes. My, we have other teachers as well. And I just want to welcome you here. Uh, day before yesterday, my friend Sharon and I and Maggie, um, precious Maggie here that serves you so diligently and faithfully, we were praying here and she kept saying something about praying about the sweetness of the Lord. I didn't even tell her this that and it just kind of came to me um, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in dehydration but I thought about this class and dehydration when you remove the water of the food you concentrate the flavors and you concentrate the sweetness and I don't know when she was praying about that Lord just you know just multiply your sweetness or something like that I don't remember the exact words I just kind of got this this thought in my head of when God removes all the junk in our life, it concentrates the sweetness. And um, I just so, you know, so I'm, I'm in the process. These last couple of days have been, I'm not going to cry, but I've been through some trials and God's getting rid of some junk and it's a little painful. And, um, but I'm believing that he's concentrating the sweetness and, and that, that my light will soon shine again <laughs> and the love of Jesus can come forth when we just let go. So um, I just wanted to share that with you today, and I just pray that you enjoy the class. Let's go before the Lord and ask a blessing on this time together. God, we just thank you for this beautiful day. We would thank you for this day, even if it was raining outside, but we especially thank you today for the coolness, the no humidity, the bright blue sky, just the freshness of spring. We just enjoy it in spite of the pollen. <laughs> we love it. We love you. We thank you for the abundance of food that you have given us, and we just just look forward to learning more and more and more ways to better um, feed our families healthier food. So we just thank you for this time. Bless the hands that have helped me so diligently prepare this. Bless each household that is represented here today. Pour out your blessings, O oh Lord God, and just reveal yourself in a mighty way to each person here. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time I do this class, I say, I am not going to do canning, dehydration, and yogurt making in the same class ever again. And every time I plan a dehydration class, I put the same <laughs> description of the class on the, on the website. And I'm like, man, i got to change that. Um, because dehydration, I could spend um, the whole day on it. So we're going to touch lightly, though, on canning and lightly on yogurt making. But the, the bulk of the class will be on dehydration. I love, love, love dehydration. Um, I have to tell you a little funny story on myself. Back in 1992, when Brad and I started this business, um, I, I wanted to sell grain mills. And I just was so in love with grinding my own grain and the nutritional benefits and all the health, you know, dynamics of all that. And I just wanted to sell grain mills. So I called the company of my grain mill and said, I'd really like to sell these grain mills. How can I become a distributor? And they said, well, here's what you need to do, blah, blah, blah. And they explained everything. And you said, they said, you need to buy our three major appliances because we'll send people to you and we want you to know about all the appliances that we carry. And I'm like, okay. So they told me, I was like, the mill. And then they told me about the wonderful Electrolux mixer that was then the Electrolux that was bigger than anything. And I had five, six children at the time. I was like, how fast can you get that here? And then a dehydrator. And I was like, I really am not interested in dehydration. I really don't want a dehydrator. 
And they were like, but why? And I was like, I just don't want a dehydrator. I want the mixer as fast as you can get here, the meal I want, but I really don't, I'm not interested in dehydrating. They were like, but you need to buy a dehydrator if you want to be a distributor for us. And I was like, I just really don't want a dehydrator. I said, only hippies dehydrate. That's what I told them. <laughs> and I said, I'm not a hippie, and I don't want to dehydrate. And they finally, I mean, after we, we kept talking, and I was telling them about my degree in food science and how I researched the health benefits, and I was teaching and, and everything, they finally they just went, Sue, buy the dehydrator. You can sell it if you don't want it. Buy the dehydrator. Don't not become a distributor because of the dehydrator. Well, the dehydrator came into the house and we were gardening and I was like, hey, you know, and so I started drying some apples and bananas. The next thing you know, I was drying everything of, around. I mean, I was in love and I ended up, before that year was over, owning four dehydrators and we were drying tomatoes, we were drying cucumbers, we were drying zucchini, everything from our garden. I absolutely fell in love with that dehydrator and two years later, I did a dehydration video for the company. <laughs> so it was really, really kind of funny. So I love, love, love dehydration. And um, so we'll get to that shortly, but I just always have to tell that story on you, on myself. You obviously are here because you're interested in dehydrating and only hippies, I mean, not only hippies dehydrate. So <laughs> if you're a hippie, go for it. You're in the right place. We're going to dehydrate. So anyway. But um, I, I, just, I just really love dehydrating. But we're going to talk about canning first. There's still a lot of things that I love to can. And I really put this class in here to catch you before your garden starts just coming abundantly um, in the summer season. So um, this is kind of my last class before, before the summertime. So there's a lot of things I still like to can. I love to can green beans, and I still love to can tomatoes. One thing I really love to can, and I'm going to show you today because I don't have a lot of produce coming in yet, is we're going to can some dry beans. And that's a wonderful thing to can in the wintertime when it's cold outside and you don't mind heating up your house. You know, that's the only downside of canning in the summertime is you just take it outside if you can. But um, I, I did a little research. I, I just, I like trivia. And I thought, when did people start putting foods in cans? And um, it was actually a contest that, um, uh, not a contest, but uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was concerned about keeping his armies fed, so he actually offered a prize to the person that could um, come up with a, a reliable method of food preservation. And so the canning process actually dates back to France, and um, this French guy conceived the idea of preserving food in bottles like they were already doing for wine. And after 15 years of experimentation, he realized that if food is sufficiently heated and sealed in airtight containers, that it would not spoil. And um, the first English canning factory opened in 1813. And then um, a, a man by the name of Thomas Kinsett immigrated to the United States. And he established the first canning facility in the United States in 1812 for oysters, meats, fruits, and vegetables. The basic principles of canning really have not changed. Some of the equipment maybe has and, and the, um, the technology, but the, the basic principles of canning are still the same. Heat sufficient to destroy microorganisms must be applied to the container, the, and then it seals the container. The canned foods are then heated under steam pressure at temperatures to 240 and 250. The amount of time of processing your canning jars depends on how big the jars are and the type of food that you have in there. Your low acid foods are going to require a little more time. Your higher acid foods are going to require a little less. And the method of canning. There's two methods of canning, water bath canning and pressure canning. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I thought this was interesting. During World War II, Many varieties and innovations be, um, occurred to bring food to fighting troops. Spam during World War II became the favorite American, uh, favorite food among American GIs. So that's kind of canning came about um, during wartime, which I think it's interesting because now we hear a lot about military ready to eat um, food that's dehydrated, but canning was, was the original. Um, the, uh, like I said before, the basic principles of canning have not changed, and, and this information is all in your handout, and I would recommend you reading, just reading through it, even though we've talked about it today. 
but heat sufficient to destroy microorganisms is, is applied to the food packed in sealed or airtight containers. And like I said before, the amount of processing time depends on the type of food, the density of the food, the acidity of the food, and how large the jar is. Um, I'm going to walk back there and we'll get started um, canning here. Um, we, we sell them though, so you could get one if you want. There are really four basic um, agents of food spoilage. You've got um, enzymes, mold, yeast, and bacteria. Your enzymes, your mold, and yeast are handled very well um, with in acidic foods, and so that's why if a food is acidic, you can water bath can it. You don't have to pressure can that because the, the acid in the food will take care of the spoilage coming from the enzymes, your mold and, back, and uh, yeast. Bacteria on the other hand is a little hardier and takes a lot higher temperatures than 212. Um, the boiling point of water is 212. So to increase the temperature that you're canning at, you must increase the pressure. And there's a little chart here in your um, handout that tells you what the temperature, the boiling point of water goes to at five pounds of pressure is 228 degrees. Most foods are pressured, are canned at 10 pounds of pressure, which is 240 degrees. And that's um, your low acid foods is what bacteria seems to thrive on because the acid is not there um, to kill it. So these low acid foods include most of your vegetables, your meats, and your fish. Of course, your meats, like if you do a soup that has meat in it, but it's a tomato-based soup, then you might be okay. Um, you just need to follow the canning guidelines. And I'm not going to go through all that today. We sell um, the Presto pressure canner. If you, you can use it like a water bath canner, you just don't put the pressure uh, weight on there. So all these years of canning, I had a water bath canner and a pressure canner, not realizing that I could have used the same pot for both. And all a water bath canner is, is a big, it's usually those blue speckled enamel big pots that have the basket where you can lift the um, jars in and out. The difference in pressure canning and water bath canning, the different method is, in water bath canning, you will completely submerge the jars in water. So that's why those baskets there are very handy for lifting the jars in and out because you're going to completely cover them with water with about an inch over the sealed jars down in the water bath and then you just turn it on and you boil it with the lid on and you boil it for however long the directions for that food tell you to to boil it in your pressure canner you're only going to put a small amount of water so you lower the jars in it does not cover the the jars and then you just bring it up to pressure and that's how you um, pressure the the pressure can your your food. Just like in pressure cooking, you've got to have some water in there to build the pressure in the pot. It's when that water starts boiling, you bring it up to pressure, then the, the temperature of that water and the temperature in the pot gets hotter and hotter and above, that's the only way you can bring it up to be above 212. There's some bacteria that um, the, the biggest main concern in your low acid canned foods is I'm sure you've all heard of botulism. Clostridia botulinum is an organism that grows very well in low acid foods and it can actually produce spores that can survive in uh, anaerobic without air conditions. So that's one of the main um, organisms you're targeting when you pressure can. So you just want to make sure, particularly, well with any food, but particularly with your low acid foods like your green beans or your corn or your peas and things like that, you want to make sure you follow the guidelines and follow the directions. And the pressure canner book comes with a, a manual that tells you the times and the pressures and for pints and quarts and all of that. So you just, you just don't want to be, oh, it's probably good, or oh, it's not quite up to pressure, oh, but it's probably okay. Not really, not with your low acid foods. And then if you're still concerned that there could be, because botulism, it's not the organism that makes you sick. The, the organism actually produces a very potent um, neurological toxin and that's what actually makes you sick. So you won't visibly see stuff growing in your low acid foods, but um, uh, just a safety precaution there, like with your home canned green beans, if you will always boil them for 10 or 15 minutes, 
that will break down um, and destroy any of that toxin that, that may be there. Because it won't taste bad. It, it won't like, like with mold and yeast and, and things like that, or enzymes, you'll actually see the food will disintegrate and they'll get mushy and the water will get cloudy. But with your low acid foods, those organisms that produce spores like botulism, you won't see any growth. It's the toxin that they produce. So that's just a precaution there. Um, nothing really to be afraid of if you've, if you've done, you know, if you, I always err on the side of too, li too much instead of too little, okay? So if I'm like, oh, I didn't hear the timer go off or oh, I forgot to set the timer, I set it so I know I'm covered, you know? So those are just some precautions there when you're um, canning your food. Home canned foods, theoretically, according to your, your Department of Agriculture tables and stuff like that, supposedly two years, but theoretically, actually, as long as it, the texture is not broken down. I mean, really, I've got some green beans that have probably been in, down there for lots of years. <laughs> so um, anyway, but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the basic principles of canning and this is whether you water bath or pressure can. These, these basic steps are going to be the same. You want to sterilize your canning jars, and you always want to use new lids. Um, your canning jars come with a two-part uh, system. This is your lid, and this is your ring. You always want to use new lids when you're canning food because once this seal, this, this rubber gasket kind of here has sealed on the jar, when you open it, number one, to pry it off, you could bend the lip of the lid. This has already been used. This gasket has been, you know, compressed. So you always want to use new lids when you're canning. The rings can be used over and over and over because there's nothing to them. In fact, once you're your food is canned and, and sealed, you can literally take the ring off and then use it um, on, your other, on your other jars or your new jars that you're canning with. You can buy lids separately. Um, you can buy jars like this. You know, I got these at Publix. You can get them at Ace Hardware. They're a basic ball canning jar. When you buy them like this, they'll come with the lid and ring already there. But you'll start accumulating a lot of jars as you use the food that you've canned. So you can always buy rings and lids separately, okay? Um, someone just showed me, she was asking me about, I, I didn't hear the name of it, the Tatler, Tatler lids. I, someone just showed me last week after Maria's class, and I just haven't had a chance to look into it. So Tatler, T-A-T-L-E-R? T-A-T-T-L-E-R. So it might be something you want to jot down and, and look into those. They're supposedly reusable. So um, always you want to sterilize your jars. <laughs> well, chasing this little ring all over the place. Um, so I just run them through the dishwasher. And then you want to pack your food into hot jars. And how I keep my jars hot is I just um, boil water and then pour it into the jars so that they stay nice and hot. Um, the, the recipe for canning dry beans, actually I found it in the Country Bean Cookbook. And um, it's on page, let's see if I, 158 in the Country Bean Cookbook there. I love this. And Brad and I did this one winter. We just picked a Saturday. I soaked all my beans, and the directions are there. You're gonna soak your beans overnight, drain off the soaking water. If you wanna start dumping this out of here, it's got water down in it. Um, you soak your beans overnight, and then drain that soaking water off, rinse the beans, and then put them in a pot, cover them completely with water, and boil them for 30 minutes. And then you're gonna pack this hot liquid into your canning jars. And um, you want your jars hot, you want your ring, your lids hot. Like I said, your rings, it doesn't matter that much. So, um, and you're gonna want, I'm sorry, I just threw off your groove. Don't throw off the emperor's groove. Right. Um, a good canning set, we sell these, you really want the right tools. And the tools that you're gonna need absolutely is a jar lifter, because um, with your pressure canning, you're gonna wanna lift the jars out. Your water bath canner, you can use the basket to lower the jars all down in, because they're completely submerged. 
Um, another couple of things is this water is boiling with your lids in it, so it's nice to have um, a magnetic lid lifter so you don't burn your fingers and have to dig down in there to get your lid out of the boiling water. So that's the lid lifter, and all of these are in um, this set. A good funnel is necessary, a good canning funnel so that you can um, get your food in the jar without just spilling it everywhere. Yeah, and what Brad's gonna do is um, just wanna dip the beans. I only did um, four cups of dry beans, so I thought we'd see how many pints it's going to make. Um, I couldn't remember it, it. They really expand a lot. Now, they're not fully cooked, but once you pressure them, they will be fully cooked canned beans without citric acid, without preservatives. We're gonna put a little salt in them, but that will be it. So um, this is, like I said, this is one of my favorite things. We did it in the winter, because they have to, um, the pints have to um, pressure can for an hour and 15 minutes. So that's a long time for that burner to be cooking. And, and so it's a great thing to do in the wintertime, unlike the summertime produce from your garden that you're gonna be canning. Great to have a burner like our um, burner over here that you can do it outside, or we actually have a big propane burner that um, we used to do all of our canning out under our carport. So someone had a question, I'm sorry, yes, sir. These are kidney beans. Um, they're organic kidney beans that we sell. And so I just soaked them last night, last thing before I left, I just covered them with plenty of water. Always cover your beans with lots of water <laughs> because when I came in this morning, they had soaked up every bit, but about that much. And they were, they were a little pile in the bottom of a bowl. And this morning when I came in, they were completely filling the bowl and only about that much water. So really cover those beans. Um, it's, I think it's four to one, four cups of water to one cup of beans is what you want to soak them in. So, um, and with the beans here and all the directions are in that uh, country bean cookbook here for, um, for canning your dry beans. You're gonna pack it into hot jars, leaving a one inch head space. And then we're gonna add a half a teaspoon of salt for our pints. And like I said, this is basic steps to whatever you're canning. And then your actual processing times and, and things like that, you're gonna have to con um, consult your owner's manual to your pressure canner because different, different foods will have different times. Yes, sir. I think a little of both. His, his question is, is the salt for preservation or taste? I think a little bit of both. You could certainly leave it out if you want to, um, but I find that if you'll salt the beans a little bit, there, it's, it's really nice to have a little bit of that flavor. And I'm using our Natural Mind Mineral Salt, so it's good salt, it's good for you. Um, so, and there's, there's no problem there with using this salt. You don't want to use the commercially iodized salt because it tends to um, make your food get soggy. It kind of breaks it down and the liquid will get very cloudy. Is that what you were going to ask? No. That's what this is. This is a natural mind sea salt. Yeah, technically it's sea salt, but it's our Redmond salt that we sell. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Well, it was for me too, but it was wonderful. It's wonderful. That's all we're gonna get. Uh huh. It, exactly. Cumin. Yeah. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Nope. No, you're still going to, right, it doesn't really matter what seasonings you add. Like I said, if you put a tomato base liquid in here, then you probably could do it more like an, um, an acid food. You just have to consult the owner's manual. But your seasonings and flavorings and things like that that you put in there should not change the um, processing time at all. Completely cooked, you can open these and eat them just like you would any cooked bean. And like I said, most of the beans that you buy in the store, the canned beans, a lot of times they have preservatives, a lot of times they have sugar, and a lot of times they have citric acid. So this way you just can do it and it's so cheap. Oh my goodness, it's so cheap. And like I said, that, that one day Saturday, I'll never forget in the winter, that winter 
We did um, several kinds. We did kidney beans, black beans, and um, pinto beans, and great northern beans. And in one Saturday morning or day, I had 56 jars of canned beans, fully cooked, that I could just open and eat. And he's going to take that and do my half a cup, half a teaspoon of salt. Um, so now we have our jars. So you want to leave about a, an inch headspace. And this is one of the tools in the um, in the canning kit that. Well, you can put here so that you can see your head, you can measure your head space. Because some things will say a half inch head space, some things will say an inch. Most of it is a half or an inch. This does three quarters and a quarter, so it just depends. And again, your canning booklet will tell you um, those instructions, okay? And if we need to add a little more liquid to these so that it brings it up to an inch, then um, we'll do that. Have you put all the salt in them? So we'll just bring it up to our inch head space with the cooking liquid here. Okay. And it looks like we got um, seven, seven jars out of four cups of dry beans. So that's seven pints out of four cups, which is four cups is about a two pound bag. Okay. So for I don't know how much the two pound bag of, I guess I should look, of kidney beans is, but for that amount of money, then we have our own cans. Yes, ma'am. You can, um, a lot of times, um, it, it'll be for shorter time, like tomatoes and things like that. But sometimes some of those high acid foods will break down under that higher heat. So just play with it a little bit there and see which way you like it better. Um, but you certainly, you certainly can if you just want the time. Because I know tomatoes, I believe it's an hour that you water bath can them, whereas in the pressure canner, you can do them 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, it, it's a lot less time. But I know my mother-in-law, when she first taught me kind of how to do this and helped me coach me a little bit, she told me that she thought that the tomatoes got a little mushy. But if you're going to just use them for sauce and things like that, it doesn't really matter. So a lot of times it's going to depend on what you are going to use them for as to how you want to do them. Yes, ma'am. I would put it in here when you're boiling it and it'll fully cook it when you're when you're done. Now, another thing that this tool is um, doubles as, the other end, one of the th steps that you're going to do is after you fill your jars, and you're not going to be able to see it as, as well here as if I had like green beans and I then you're going to pour the boiling water over your um, raw, you pack your green beans into hot jars, raw green beans, pour your boiling water over, but one of the steps you must do is you must get the air bubbles out of the jar. So you just run this little tool down the side and just pull it gently towards you. And like I said, if, if the had didn't have the dark liquid, you could see the bubbles kind of go blub, 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 like that. And then, um, blub, 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 that was, hmm, okay. Y'all knew what I was talking about, all you ladies for sure. You guys are like, I'm not sure about that one. But, um, yes. Uh-huh. They um, pack them a little tighter in the jars. Her question was, they exploded. Hmm. I just don't know. Does anybody know what to, how to keep your tomatoes from floating to the top after you can them? I, you know, sometimes these will even do that too a little bit. Um, I, I just don't know how to help you there. Um, the other thing you're gonna want to do is just take a clean paper towel or a clean rag, and you're going to want you don't want any salt crystals or water or anything like that on um, on your uh, lip here. Let's get rid of this. Uh, yes. Just put it right here. This goes down in the bottom drawer there. Or actually just sit it for right there. I'm going to use it again in a minute. Okay. So you don't want any liquid or salt granules or food, you know, if you have an, another type of food you're packing in. So you just want to take your clean paper towel or a clean, whoops, yeah, that was, it's hot. A clean, um, and just wipe the edge and then put the hot lids on. And then you, you want to tighten the ring down. You don't necessarily have to <laughs> 
kung fu grip it here, but just tighten it, okay? So guys, don't go crazy here, just tighten it. Okay. Snug. Just snug, just till it's there. I didn't pressure cook them. I was just using my pressure pot to just boil them because it was the biggest pot I had this morning. So, so um, boil the beans for 30, 30 minutes. minutes. Yeah. So they weren't pressured. They were just, I soaked them overnight, drained the soaking water off, rinsed them slightly, put them back in a pot, completely covered them with water, and then boiled them for about 30 minutes. And then I packed the hot beans in the jars here. And then now we're going to transfer these over to the pressure canner. Now, um, the pressure canner... Like I said, with a water bath canner, you're going to fill the whole pot with water and um, well, you're going to take it up about three quarters, bring it up to a boil, then you lower your um, pot, your jars down. Actually, I'm sorry, with water bathing, you lower your jars in, then you turn your heat on, bring the water up to a boil. Once the water is boiling, you start your time. With the pressure canner, you're going to put about how much? Three quarts? Three quarts of water, three quarts of water in, bring it up to two tablespoons of white vinegar, and the directions are in the owner's manual. And um, I particularly like the Presto pressure canner. It's stainless steel, um, so I really like that. And if you would, when you get that going, if you would read to me how many of each size jar it'll do. It's on the front of the box. Oh, we'll do uh, 24 half pints, 20 pints, and 27 Okay, seven quarts. Right, but it'll do seven, <laughs> seven quarts, which you wouldn't want to mix. You don't want to mix sizes there, okay? You want to use the same size jars at a time because you're going to have different um, processing times for different size jars. So seven quarts, the pressure canner will hold. Um, how many pints? 20 pints. 10, you double stack them um, on the um, pint, and then 24 half pints. That's the little smaller jars. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So there's a, um, okay, so if you'll show, hold them up, bring the lid over here to me, would you, and let me show them, and the weight. This is my old pressure canner, you can tell, it's been around. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's your lid, and it's got a weight that's going to go on your pressure valve, and then it's got your gauge that's going to move and tell you what, how much pressure is in the pot, okay? And you, um, what you're going to do is you're going to put your three quarts of water in, bring it to a boil. Um, you're, you'll have your, your jars in there. You put your lid on. You're going to let the steam vent out of this hole for 10 minutes? 10 minutes. You want to see a nice, not just a blub blub bl bubble. There's that blub blub again. Anyway, that's my word of the day. But a nice um, stream of steam coming out of this hole, and um, for about 10 minutes, and then you're going to put your valve on, your weight on, and then your pressure will start building. Okay. And then once your pressure is up, just like how many of y'all have regular pressure cookers that you cook in, just like with that, you're going to lower your temperature so that you're just maintaining that pressure. And you really don't want to go off and leave this right away because you don't want that pressure to drop down. You've got to sit there with it for a little bit and, until you get it where it stays at that pressure for a good five or 10 minutes and then you know it's not gonna go up or down or, you know. It's not as bad to go up, but you don't want it to go down because you don't want it to be below the pressure that you're supposed to be pressuring it, the pounds that you're supposed to be pressuring. Yes, sir. Um, no, you can put them right on top. With your um, pressure canner, there's, it, they're not like floating in water, so it's fine to just double stack them. You don't have to put anything between them. So anybody else have a question? Yes. Um, yes, you can use your regular pressure cookers. Um, your high pressure, your second ring, I believe, is 12, or is it 15? I, consult your owner's manual. I'm pretty sure it's 15 pounds of pressure on your second ring. I'm, I'm pretty sure, and this, and this first one is 12. So, um, but yes, you can use your pressure canners, um, I mean your pressure cookers to can in, absolutely. Again, 
consult. There's, I'm sure there's canning charts and times and stuff on the internet now. You can get everything off the internet. And that's what I tell people. If you are a gardener, oops, sorry. If you're a gardener and, and you're going to be doing a lot of canning, I would invest in a pressure canner. I mean, I would invest in the Presto and just go ahead and get it because you'll be able to do large amounts. If you're going to just do some like can be like I just did, maybe four, five, six pints or at a time, and maybe a couple of quarts of something else, then I would just use your pressure cooker that you already have. But you're not going to be able to do large quantities in those, you know, even the 10 liter pressure cooker. I think you could only probably fit four quarts in there. I'm not. I'm not sure. We'd have to measure it. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Well, no, actually, for, for your dry beans, you mean, it's the preparation is exactly the same, and it's the size of the jar um, you're going to do the same. Black-eyed peas might be a little different because they cook a little faster. Lentils, things like that might be, but your, your black beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, great northerns, all of those you're going to go ahead and pressure can at that um, for an hour and 15 minutes at 10 pounds of pressure. But that's it, basically. So like even, you know, your raw green beans, you're going to see a raw pack. You're going to see hot packs in the owner's manual. You just decide. Typically with me canning my green beans from the garden, I raw packed them into hot jars, raw packed them, poured the, put the salt in, poured the boiling water over. Um, I usually like to put my salt in before I add my extra liquid because then it, it gets, washes the salt down into the whole jar. Um, so, and then, like I said, the trick is using getting these tools to get those air bubbles out and then putting your hot ring, lid on and tightening your ring down um, just till it's snug and then processing it whichever way you need to do it yes ma'am uh-huh yes uh-huh um, I don't think that I would can my fully cooked black eyed peas. I would probably freeze those. Yeah, because it's going to cook them even more and they're going to almost fall apart. I think I would freeze my cooked beans and then just take them out and, and heat them. Um, but now, if you had raw pea, you know, black eyed peas before you cooked them and you wanted to can some so they're ready so you don't have to cook them later either way and that's you're gonna find there's a place and especially if you're gardening there's foods that I like to freeze there's foods that I like to dry and there's foods that I like to can water bath and pressure you're just you're just gonna play with it a little bit um, and and see what what you like I did dehydrate some green beans and I'll tell you I really really enjoyed those um, it took a while for them to dehydrate but when I rehydrated them and cooked them, they taste like they had just been picked from the garden. So, um, but it, it, was, it was a little more tedious, and so I still canned some, but I dried some as well. Tomatoes, um, we dehydrated tomatoes one summer, um, and uh, it's, it's pretty cool <laughs> um, to dehydrate them. We still, I still canned them, and I still made some tomato sauce, but um, drying them was wonderful. We, Brad had 100 tomato plants. And every other day, we pick two six-gallon buckets of um, two or three six-gallon. And I'm surprised Ashley hasn't come in here yet. She's probably hearing me out there. She goes, oh, yes, the tomato duty. <laughs> so the boys had to pick the tomatoes while the girls and I cleaned out the dehydrators. And um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself telling you my tomato story. And they would come up. We would wash them. Brad would run the mandolin slicer, and we would slice the tomatoes, and then my Six children sat around the dining table and put them in the. Yes, yeah, see the free flow of steam? Okay. All righty. But anyway, so we sat around our dining table and um, put all those tomatoes. That's why I had to end up with four dehydrators, <laughs> 10 trays tall with all those tomatoes. And then, and it would take two, it would take. 24, 48, 48 hours to dry them because tomatoes are so full of water. Well, then by then we had two more buckets. So we were, the, the, the house duty was cleaning out the dehydrators and we powdered them. And here's the deal. We could get the powder of 100 tomatoes in a quart jar. 
If I had canned 100 tomatoes, whew, it would have been lots of cans and lots of space, but 100 tomatoes powdered would go in a quart jar. And then you're going, okay, well, what do you do with the powder? Rehydrate it with water, add some Italian seasoning, make sauce, use it as paste, like if my spaghetti sauce was thin, and you, instead of the can of tomato paste, you could add a tablespoon of powder. And um, so it, it's, it's really, really, you're gonna love dehydration. Um, so don't be like me and resist <laughs> and think that only hippies dehydrate. Once you start dehydrating, you will absolutely love it. If, I'm not sure. I'm not one. I might be one if I don't know what it is. How do I know? Anyway, and these, the lids that you didn't use, um, you just want to make sure that uh, you separate them and they get good and dry because if you just pull them out and leave them stacked together, they'll mold. So just um, see there, like these two, they get that water in there, yeah, and they stick together. So just, if you don't use them, you, you know, on the jar, even though you've heated them, they're fine. You can still use them to can with. So when I'm, when I'm saying you need to use new ring, uh, lids each time, doesn't matter if you've heated this one. Typically, I only heat what, what I think I'm going to need. But, um, so you just want to make sure these get good and dry so that they don't um, mold or mildew when you pack them up or store them. All righty. All right, moving on to my favorite, dehydration. Any questions on canning before we leave it? Yes. The, um, can, can you pick up that country bean cookbook there and hold it up? There we go, country bean cookbook. One of my, that's one of my favorite recipes <laughs> out, of the, out of the whole book is the canning. And she's got other canning things. She tells you how to do some soups, some bean soups and, and things like that in, in that same book. Really, really great book. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. What I was just using? Mm -hmm. Yes, this one's electric. This is an induction burner that I use here. Um, that pressure cooker is not magnetic. I need to see if the, the new ones are. In fact, hey Brad, wherever you are, would you see if the new pressure cooker is magnetic? Yeah, because I was trying to get one of those things. Oh yeah, they're one. Yes, we'll make sure and I'll tell you in just a minute. Or Sharon. There's a, or Brad, there you are. There's a Presto pressure canner out there. Would you come get the magnetic trivet and see if it's magnetic? And do you have those uh, right Yes, ma'am. They're fabulous. Um, would you just see if that'll stick to the new ones? What she's talking about, for those of you that didn't notice, this is the Fissler induction burners. The more I use them, the more I love them. <laughs> I use them mainly just here at the store, but I really miss them when I go home because, um, and they're especially nice when you're um, pressure cooking or canning or whatever because you can actually set a timer on it. So once you get that pressure up and then get the, the temperature lowered so that it maintains that pressure, then you can set this timer and it will, um, hey Brad, turn your microphone off. Um, it will, uh, it will, you can set the timer and it'll turn itself off so you don't have to worry about coming back to it. No, the reason for the vinegar in the water is so there won't be any water stains on the jars. Oh, okay. So the vinegar in the water is to prevent water stains in the jars. So if you don't have vinegar, you can still can. Is it, it magnetic? Is not. It's not magnetic. So it's the. It has to be a magnetic pot. So even though some of your pots are stainless steel, some, they're not all magnetic. The pressure cookers are, yes, mm -hmm. yep, they're magnetic. So um, the induction burner heats by magnetism. And um, it, it's very, very nice unit, and it's got a lot of safety features. In fact, we sold um, one of these to an um, elderly lady that was concerned about forgetting to leave the burner on and things like that, because it has a um, safety feature that'll shut off, so, yeah. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move this over here. Any questions about canning? Yes, ma'am. Do I can corn? No, I haven't. I usually freeze corn, but that's just me. Um, I, do you love to can it?
Okay. Didn't didn't can corn. I never. I mean, my mother never did. She always froze corn. We canned tomatoes, beans, okra, all kinds of things. But we never. She never canned corn. She always froze it. And maybe that's why. I I just don't know. So the and. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna believe her for sure. I would go with the the trusted experience there. You know. So anyway, okay. All right. So now that was canning, and um, huh? Yes. Can you can squash? You can can anything. My sister cans boiled peanuts. Huh. In fact, she does her peanut yeah, except corn. Um, I mean. <laughs> um, you can can it if you want to. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I just go to a website, look in the owner's manual to your pressure canner, your water bath canner. It would be a low acid food, so you would have to pressure it. All right. So that's the key. High acid are usually your tomatoes, your fruits, you know, things like that. Your low acid are your meats, your beans, your peas, your corn <laughs> that you can't can. But anyway, so yes, sir. The, that brand? Yeah. No, we sell the Fistler and the Kunra Khan, and we we have another brand. I can't even remember the name of it. I, I'm very very partial to the Fistler. Um, I don't. I really don't because I have a stainless steel pot down here that's not magnetic, so I can't use it on my um, induction burner. But I mean, you can can on your regular burner in your kitchen. Um, it's just nice to have a either a gas burner or a like the induction burner, something portable that you can take outside in the summertime to can. But I, I do the I do the canning at our house. I do it outside on a single burner with a gas canister. Almost like what like comes in the fryer. turkey fryer or that's the fish. That's what I yeah. use. That's what we use. Man, you can bring things up to pressure in no time, and yeah. you're, you're done with it. Yes. I'm, I'm sure if it, if it will get hot enough, you certainly can use it. Yeah, you can use that. A lot of people think that you can only use that because that's what we use in the class. We have no stovetop, so we have to use these portable units, either the electric one or the gas one. And the main reason I'm using the gas today is because it's not magnetic, or we would be using the... Um, the Fistler induction burner, but I love the Fistler induction burners. Okay, let's move on to dehydration. <clears throat> dehydration is probably the oldest form of food preservation. Think about it logically. No refrigeration. What? What am I going to do with all these grapes coming in? Make wine make or ferment it, and I believe their, their wine of those days was probably like what we do with the kefir here. Um, it's a fermented grape juice or dry your foods. Um, dates, figs, you'll see all of those talked about um, in the Bible, and um, that, like I said, that is the oldest method of food preservation is dehydration. There's some great advantages to dehydration. Nutritionally, now listen to this. 97% of your nutrients are retained in dehydration. 60 in freezing, 40 in canning. Okay, this is huge. So nutritionally, if it'll dry, do it. And, and, you know, and if you like the final product, like I said, I still canned tomatoes and I still canned beans because I didn't want everything dried that way, you know, and used that way. So this is a huge, huge thing. Also, you are removing the water. That's how you're preserving this food. Every living thing must have water, okay, to survive. I'm not sure what that timer is. Oh, okay, it's a bomb. <laughs> anyway, um, I just didn't recognize. Usually, I've got the stove one. So, um, did everyone finally get oatmeal and biscuits? They did. You did. All right, great. No, she's like, no, I didn't. Okay. We'll see if we can come up with something. You'll get an extra muffin. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I don't know what I was saying. Um, when you remove the water, you concentrate the flavor. So just like I was saying before, if that fruit was relatively sweet before, it's going to be even sweeter afterwards. So that's also a thing you can use. I mean, I'm not saying use 
uh, lesser quality fruit, but if that apple is not as sweet this year, you might not want to make your applesauce out of it. Dry it, because then it will be a little sweeter and nicer um, flavor there. Um, any food that contains natural sugar becomes um, even sweeter when dehydrated. I love dehydrating food. Um, I'll never forget uh, right after I had gotten my dehydrator and started dehydrating everything, we actually went on a ski trip with some other families and we drove to Colorado over the week of Thanksgiving. We normally fly, but this time we chose to drive. And there we were in the car for three days with six, I was pregnant with Olivia. So I was pregnant with my seventh child. And um, so to prepare for that trip, I actually dried pineapple, bananas, beef jerky, and apples. The other cars were eating chips. What do you think got all over their car? Crumbs. We were like, you know, here, here's a snack as we were driving. And it got to be so funny that um, we were caravanning with two other cars and, um, and they would stop and wave us down and go, pass us the beef jerky, you know. <laughs> so um, it's great for snacks. We, when we went to adopt our first son in Latvia in 2009, I took beef jerky, dried fruit, because they could go um, easily in a suitcase, lightweight, and I didn't know how many days it was going to be before we would get food <laughs> after we were there because we flew the first year into Stockholm and then had to drive three and a half hours south in Sweden and, and have a business meeting, come back up to Stockholm, and then uh, take a boat to Latvia. Anyway, I didn't mean to tell you all that. But so I was like, you know, I didn't know where we were going to eat if we were everywhere. So I was like, I've got dried food. So um, you will love, it's great to put in kids' lunch boxes, backpacks. I mean, you're just going to really, really love it. And there's more to drying than just apples. Um, so we're going to, um, preparation. What I love about dehydration, like I already told you my tomato story, guess who can be involved in dehydration? Like it or not, the whole entire family. Um, whereas canning, I was usually like, can y'all just get out of the kitchen? <laughs> you know, because you don't want that little one there when you're pouring boiling water into the jars. But canning, even a three or four year old can put tomatoes out on a dehydrator. So you will love um, dehydration and honestly, the tools that you need for dehydration, a good knife is great. Now, I do have some other tools that I absolutely love. If you're going to grow a lot of zucchini and things like that, slicer shredder attachment on my um, mixer, the kitchen assistant, fabulous. And you're going to see me um, use that today. However, if you don't have that, where's my box grater? Hmm. Well, the box grater, you're going to see me use that, and that's what I used prepping for this class. It is the best box grater I have ever used. We need to try to find it. Sharon, if you'll come see if it's there. I know that's the new one. I'm, I'm looking for, huh? Oh, okay, Caleb's doing it. All right. But um, I love the box grater. The slicer side and the grating side is perfect for um, grating zucchini, and it's this is different from any box grater I've ever owned. And <laughs> you may be going, well, that's so exciting about a box grater. Um, most of your box graters, the, the metal is just punched, and so it's naturally sharp because it's just cut. But these, they actually sharpen those, those um, parts. And then, yeah, and they etched, there's a metal etching down, um, have we found the box grater? Oh, there we go, thank you. Timing. I'm going to turn my temp temperature down a little bit. Thank you, sweetie. Um, you might can see from where you're sitting, there's actually etchings here, and so the food slides a lot easier over um, the surface of the box grater. Um, I don't use this a lot. I do a, the cover that, so you can just grate right in there like when you're doing cheese or something like that. But the nice thing about the box grater is when I'm preparing my things to dehydrate, I can just put it right on my tray and just grate, lift it, and then spread, and, and then go. So um, box grater is very handy. A blender or food processor um, is very handy for pureeing to make your fruit leathers and things like that. Um, versatility, dried foods can be used in lots of ways. <laughs> um, uh, we've got some soup mix over there. I just chopped up onion, carrot, celery, just like I'd put in a pot of soup, 
and just dried it. And great gift ideas at Christmas time, you know, dry some of this and give it to somebody with your favorite soup recipe. Um, you know, when things go on sale or when, you know, go to, down to the farmer's market in Atlanta, get, you know, big cases of carrots or zucchini. If you have a friend, you don't need to go buy zucchini. But anyway, um, just remember when you're prepping your food to dehydrate, however you want it to look fresh, okay, that's the way you want to, that's what size you want to cut it because you're like, how big do I want these apples? Well, if you want those apples for pie, then cut them the size you're going to use that you want the finished product to look like. They're going to shrink when you take that water out, but then you can rehydrate them by putting water over them, letting them soak, and they'll rehydrate, and they'll look just like fresh apples, you know. So those are things you want to remember. Squash, drying yellow squash is fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. In fact, I have some here I'll show you in a minute. And the same, if you want it for squash casserole, then slice it the size you want it to be because it's going to rehydrate, absorb um, those, the liquids. Now, if when you start using dehydrated food in cooking, you're going to want to rehydrate it. So you're going to see, I'm going to soak, I'm going to make some bread for you here in a minute, and I'll soak the, um, the food in water first. If you're not going to do that, if you're going to add, say, your soup mix to stew, then just know that you're going to probably want a little more liquid added, or you're going to want to watch the pot and add a little liquid because um, it will reab it'll absorb a lot of that water that's there. Just the same way with the dry tomato powder. When you put a little tablespoon in your spaghetti sauce, it'll thicken that up, you know. So um, you're going to use it like tomato paste. And uh, I think I used to use, when I'd make tomato sauce for my pizzas, I did a quarter cup of tomato powder and a cup of water and just let it sit for about 15 or 20 minutes, and it was thick, really thick sauce. So um, those are things that you can do. The possibilities with dehydration are limitless, really, really, truly. I mean, just think about it. Um, so it's, we're going to do some fun things with uh, the dehydration. Some advantages for dehydration versus canning and freezing. We've already talked about the nutritional benefits, the prep. I mean, I don't blanch my food before I um, dehydrate it. A lot of books will tell you to. It, it just depends on, on what it is, but there is nothing that I dehydrate that I blanch first. Um, so dehydration just requires a lot less work. You simply cut the food, put it in, turn it on, and that's it. Um, you can dehydrate outside, so if it's in the summertime, because they are warm, and you don't want the warm air, or the smell of what you're dehydrating, okay? We had um, oregano growing. I mean, like a patch this big, the plants were this big, and so I, um, I cut all the, um, the uh, stems, stalks, and just laid them all in the dehydrator, four dehydrators full of oregano, and um, I originally had them all inside, and the volatile oils got so strong, I was like, I got to where I couldn't breathe because our whole house smelled like a Mamma Mia's pizzeria. <laughs> so, and the funny thing was, I, so I got them all outside and finally kind of aired out the house and opened it up, and Brad was working nights at the time. He was still doing construction, and he came in and was kind of frazzled. When he gets home, he's, it's such intense work that he would get home kind of, kind of wired, not at all ready to um, go to bed. So he saw the dehydrators out there with all the oregano in it, and it was dry, so he decided he would strip it all for me. So he came in and stripped it all. Well, the smell of it, when he got in bed, it was like, <gasps> oh, what's that smell again? It was just kind of about went into anaphylactic shock from the... <laughs> so there's some things you definitely want to do outside. Onions. Do them outside. I said that in my last class, and this lady came in the store about three days later, and she said, I didn't believe you. And she goes, oh, please tell everybody, do your onions outside. So um, anyway, and I've got a great um, visual aid for doing onions. But anyway, basically, you're just going to chop, slice, grate, however you are wanting to use it. Grated zucchini, if you're going to want zucchini muffins, carrot cake, or whatever, grate it. Put it in. Um, the great thing about dehydration, like I already said, 100 tomatoes powdered in a quart jar takes a lot less space. Um, that little cup of zucchini that I grated yesterday to put in the muffins came out like this, you know, and then just rehydrate it and it'll, come, it'll rehydrate back up. So a lot less space. Honestly, let me get my baskets of goodies here. This is how I store my dehydrated food. 
I store it in Ziploc bags. <laughs> and then I put these Ziploc bags in my buckets. I usually do my, um, my vegetables in one, or if I have strong aromatic, like onions that I don't want smelling up other things, you could double bag them if you have some of those stronger flavors. But I do my vegetables in one and my fruits in the other. And um, I have, how long will these things store? Technically, I think they, again, you know, if you go on a agricultural website, it may say a year, two years, or whatever. These Vidalia onions were dried in 1998. I'll pass them around. You can open the bag and smell them. It smells like the county fair. <laughs> um, you, will, you will just absolutely love um, dehydration. One of um, the book that I used to use for dehydration was called Dehydration Made Simple. You might can find it on Amazon, but it's out of print. But we have this customer that um, has written this book on dehydration, and it's great. Absolutely fantastic. And it's $15. She gives you all sorts of ideas. Still good? He's not dead. Didn't die. We'll check him in about an hour, see if he's... <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, but this is a great book on dehydration, and she even tells you how to make yogurt and some spray, um, rubs, and, and she's even got, like, mushrooms. Brad and I grew mushrooms. Um, not that kind, but another kind. Um, she talkies, and uh, we dried those. I still have some of those, and we haven't grown those in, golly, 98, 99? Yeah, so, um, so this is a great, great book on dehydration. There is also recipes in the back of my cookbook. You probably didn't get that far to know that I actually had some dehydration. Remember, I just started really loving the dehydrator. Just a few of the basics, beef jerky, coconut. Coconut is what, fresh coconut. It will take you longer to get the coconut out of the shell and grated than it will for it to dry. It dries in about an hour, and it is absolutely delicious. Apples, tomatoes, um, fruit leathers, cucumbers, orange peels, and zucchini. So those were some of the first things that I um, enjoyed doing. Spoilage on your, um, most of your food is indefinitely, it will store, except your beef jerky, your coconut, um, anything that has a lot of oil in it. Now, I added some oil to my marinated zucchini here. So those things, if it's got oil or fat, then those will go rancid, even though um, it's dehydrated. But still, you're looking at several months, not a week or two, you know. So... Um, Got some great, great things there. I'm going to sit these on top here because I'm going to be referring those to just in just a minute. Yes. You certainly could, or you could do. Um, uh, you could get 19. Yeah, you could. Her question was for long-term stir. Long-term. <laughs> Storage. I just need to talk southern. Long-term storage. Um, you know, you could put an oxygen absorber. You could use some of the vacuum sealers. Um, yes, you know, the vacuum sealers. You could do that. But obviously, I mean, you really don't. And the, another beautiful thing about dehydration is I can open this bag and use out of it. Whereas in canning and freezing, you're kind of stuck. When you open that jar of beans, you got to use it or now it's going to spoil. Or when you take that thing out of the freezer and let it all thaw out, you got to use that whole amount. So um, that's the nice thing uh, about dehydration and just doing them in the... Now, I use the heavier Ziploc uh, or freezer weight bags, sealable bags. But um, there, I mean, yes, if you were going to really, really store it a long time and maybe your beef jerky and coconut, if you vacuum sealed those, then perhaps they would last definitely much longer. I don't know if I would worry about it so much with your things that don't have oil in them. Okay? I think I have some apples that are down there that are like from 1995. So, um, yeah, and they're, they're a little dark. Um, your higher acid foods um, are not going to turn as dark, you know, from oxidation. Also, I've found with the two dehydrators we sell, the Excalibur and the Sedona, I have found because they dry so much um, more quickly and efficiently that my food does not turn as dark. The original dehydrator that I started with was the type that has the fan in the bottom and blows up. You, you actually build, and we still sell the um, Lequip. It's a great starter dehydrator if you don't think you're going to like garden, you just want to do some beef jerky and fruit leathers and fruit 
so every now and then. That's definitely a very reasonable, um, reasonably priced dehydrator. It's the one I started with, and I own four of them, and it dried everything. But I found that stuff, um, the food tended to turn dark because it did take a little longer to dry. These start drying very, very quickly. So you're going to see, um, like Sharon, will you bring me the tray of the soup mix out of that? I want you to see how beautiful um, these vegetables still are. Um, no, no oxidation, no turning dark here. This is, um, I did this so you could see, this is one onion, four stalks of celery, and three or four carrots, I don't remember. So this is about what I would put in a pot of soup. Look how much, <laughs> how much it, it was full, you know, mounded up, and look how much it dehydrated down. So, you know, buy these things when they're on sale, put them in a jar or a bag. And what I tend to do with things that, like, things that I'm going to use for a specific recipe, then I will grate or process that much for that recipe, and then I'll put it in my bag. Like, I've got one here. This is Garden Harvest. The recipe is in your book for the bread. This is one apple, one zucchini, and one carrot. And so now I just have that, and I know that that's already ready, and that's for that one recipe. Um, I know that I think she gives you amounts like what one carrot or half a cup of carrot will equal a cup rehydrate or whatever. She'll give you those, um, those measurements, I believe, of what, what it, how much dried food it takes to rehydrate to make what you need. Yes. Yes, can you mound it up and will it dry? Yeah, we mounded those onions up pretty good. Um, I wouldn't just like do it two or three inches deep. It's gonna take longer to dehydrate that way if you mound your food up. Things like spinach, <laughs> yeah, mound it up because it's not that much spinach and it'll dry very, very quickly. But your wetter things, I wouldn't mound these up too much. Also think about um, if you want them to be separated, you know, if you're not gonna powder these, and you want to use these um, pieces individually, then you don't want to overlap them because when they take, when the water dehydrates out, it's going to all stick together. But if you're going to just throw your tomatoes or your cucumbers or whatever in a blender and powder them, then it doesn't matter if you've got them overlapping because you'll just take out the big hunk and break them up. But if you want the pieces separate, then you need to separate them, not mound them, them up. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, her, okay, um, let me tell you what I did here. This is um, zucchini that I marinated to and, and seasoned because I want to use this like vegetable chips, like zucchini chips, or I actually, um, the, the class got so big, so y'all can get mad at that many people coming if you want. I was gonna do pizza and I'm like, I can't do pizza for 70 people, it's just too many. Um, but I love to use this like pepperoni on my, on my pizza. It is absolutely delicious. So we're gonna go ahead and um, let you have a taste of this. And I tell you what, we'll snip some of the beef jerky and then I'm gonna start telling you how to, how to do these things. So um, this is my beef jerky. The recipe is actually in my red cookbook. Sharon, you can snip them a piece of this and a um, piece of that and put it in um, a little cup. If you wanna go ahead and serve them the kale chips, you could put that in there too because it's all kind of a salty, salty flavor. So they're in the, uh, the not microwave. Here, let, you wanna bring it and I'll show them the kale chips. Um, this is fresh kale and um, the recipe is in your handout. This is from a raw foods class. And what we did was we made this almost like a dressing out of um, almond butter, tahini that we sell, um, some soy sauce, water, lemons, green onions, garlic, and just pureed it all and then toss the fresh kale with this goo, this lick, this dressing, and then just put it in the dehydrator. And now we made these chips out of it. And this is a real um, favorite among raw food people. Um, and these, I've had kale chips bought in the store. <laughs> um, they're not very tasty and um, they're expensive. Yes. 
Now you got to understand, you're going to see why this dehydrated food seems very, very expensive. That is one onion, four stalks of celery, and you know, three or four carrots, two or three carrots. Look at that little mound of food. You're really getting a lot more than you think you are. But oh my goodness, it's so cheap to do it yourself. So, um, so there's what you could do there. So that is. They smell. Yeah. Awful. They do stink. <laughs> They're, um, they almost, they don't have any cheese or anything in them, but they almost taste like Parmesan cheese. So they have that very pungent Parmesan cheese smell. So, um, yeah, my, my little daughter-in-law, Amanda, she was, when I, the first time I made them, she was like, what is that stink? It stinks all the way to the front door. So we had to put them outside, but we like to eat them, but they do smell um, when you're dehydrating them. Yes. Um, you know, um, she asked when I dried the green beans, could you eat them as a snack? Yes, you could. There's a big difference in this type of dehydration and um, freeze dried. And a lot of your snacky things that you buy at the store that have that crunch and almost taste real, real sweet, um, I, I don't know what they're putting on them, first of all, but that's freeze dried. You're not going to get that that snack that you're thinking of, that green bean. I, I don't think you'll enjoy eating dried green beans in the dehydrator. That's a freeze dried product and I don't, okay. Um, she said I have several different things going in the dehydrator at the same time. Um, I, you'll see I have two dehydrators here. That was my kale chips, my, gar, uh, my onions, carrots, celery. That was my kind of savory pungent and then this was my fruit dehydrator. I certainly would not put kale chips and pineapple or bananas in the same dehydrator. I just wouldn't do it. Yes. So think about that when you're drying what you, you know, like uh, zucchini, I think I put in here with, with my fruit. It was okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Now, I would not rehydrate the slices of zucchini to use as pepperoni. We actually dried those, and I'm going to show you how I made those um, just right now here in just a second. Um, I'll show you how I made the dry zucchini and uh, the chips. I wouldn't rehydrate them. Now, you must, if you're going to grate zucchini to use in zucchini bread, yes, that you would rehydrate. But if you'll put the, if, when you put the zucchini chips on the pizza, just the moisture and stuff that's in the cheese and the steam that's kind of in the oven will rehydrate that. They, they, they won't be crispy. They'll be like pepperoni. Um, it's, they're very, very tasty. Yes. Um, London Broil. We're going to get there. Okay, let's start, let's start dehydrating. Yes. Nama Soyu is a, is a natural soy sauce. It's a... Um, no. No, it's a, it's a fermented, a nat, what was nama soyu in your kale chip recipe? It's a naturally fermented soy sauce, I do believe. Am I right? Yes, it's not like your Bragg's amino acids. Yeah. I mean, you can play with that recipe and maybe substitute the Bragg's there if, if you want. I mean, that, remember, recipes are suggestions, so you could certainly change that up if you want. Do you use the Bragg's in place of soy sauce? Okay, well then go for it. Yeah, I would, try, I would try it. Okay, let me show you how easy, easy, easy it is to dehydrate foods. This is the hard part about this class is I never know where to put everything. All right. This is, we sell, um, we sell three dehydrators. The Lequip is, like I said, the one with the fan in the bottom. Um, the trays are actually the dehydrator. You stack the trays up and build the dehydrator. It has a lid. Blows air up from the bottom. Our two favorites are the Excalibur and the Sedona. Okay? The nice thing about these dehydrators is the fan is in the back. Um, well, they have added the temperature dial on the Lequip as well. You have a temperature dial here so you can set it to dehydrate at whatever temperature you choose. Nice thing about the Excalibur, it actually has a chart here telling you um, what, like, what meat should be dehydrated at, um, uh, what temperature. 
yogurt you can use this as your incubator for making yogurt which is why I put yogurt making in this class um, raw food your living foods you want to dehydrate at 115 or lower okay so that you keep those enzymes intact so like your kale chips your fruit and vegetables it's going to take longer to dehydrate but you're going to get keep those enzymes okay and it's going to be just like eating fresh fruit and vegetables all your enzymes are intact if you dry at a lower temperature meat on the other hand you you don't want to dry at 115 degrees because it will spoil before it dehydrates okay so your meat is going to be at 145 all right let me show you how easy 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 uh, dehydrating is um, first we'll do I'll show you how I did the marinated zucchini since that's what you're about to eat also a good cutting board nice okay and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use my box cutter and I'm going to actually I'm going to leave it on for these because I'm going to um, marinate these I'm going to slice I use my slicer side I find it to be perfect um, width for my chips now I think this is a little small for like squash casserole okay so I would probably just use my knife and cut it the you know because that you usually want your squash about that thick so here's my zucchini okay and I'm gonna get a bowl put my zucchini slices in now what I um, marinated them with I put just a little bit of olive oil now if I were gonna dry these to fry later I would cut them the thickness that I want them dry them and then to fry them then you're gonna rehydrate them with water let them sit for 15 to 20 minutes then you'll take them out and pat them dry just like and then start using them just like you would fresh zucchini so you're going to find that they'll rehydrate and feel and look almost like fresh yeah like yes yep which yeah we're fixing to make a garden harvest bread um, now what I'm going to marinate these with when you taste it I'm going to use my favorite roasted red pepper this is our seasoning dip mixes that I use a lot of times for marinades for rubs for my meat I'm going to just um, use a couple of tablespoons here and I'm going to powder it so that it's a powdery consistency because if I use these big chunks on here they're going to fall off they're not going to stick to the zucchini so I'm going to just take a couple of tablespoons maybe three Uh, um, you just have to eyeball it this is I just did one here this is actually probably way too much for one I'm usually doing a whole bowl full so um, and again you just want to get it good and coated and I'm going to use my try best blender to just powder it and then I'm just going to sprinkle this over And I'm going to add a little salt. Remember, if it's remotely flavorful, and then I just stir it. If it's remotely flavorful before you dehydrate, it's going to be really nice and flavorful. So don't keep adding salt or something like that until it tastes really salty to you. Go ahead and do, you know you'll find what it needs to taste like um, I mean you want it to taste right but you don't want it to be overly salty or heavily sweetened because it will get sweeter um, I might add, I might would add just a little bit more um, sprinkle a little bit more of the powder on here till it's nice and coated I don't know if I'm gonna be okay just a little more just want it nice and coated and here's my um, and then we're going to refrigerate it overnight here's mine that I prepared ahead of time so now it's completely marinated and then I just lift them out 
and lay them on the tray. And like I said, these I want to use as chips, so I'm going to lay them out, not overlapping or touching. Okay? So that's, that's the zucchini. And that's it. Just um, your dehydration times, um, this is a great book. She gives you some approximates. Again, though, it's going to depend on how thick you slice it, how much moisture is actually there. So I just, you're going to figure it out. And you really, other than beef jerky and fruit leathers, you, it's really difficult to over dehydrate something. I mean, it just gets a little drier, you know, and there comes a point where how much drier can it get, you know. So um, your beef jerky will get almost brittle, but you can still eat it. It's just a little tougher. Um, to, it's a little more crunchy. But um, so your drying times, like these are probably going to take maybe overnight. I find I put things on at night and just wake up the next morning and there it is. Um, you know, the dehydrators take about um, or use about, I think it's about eight cents an hour to run, uh, maybe a little more now. That was, oh, that was like 1990-something data. So, yeah, probably double that. <laughs> Obama, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, never mind, we're not going there. <laughs> Inflation. <laughs> don't leave, don't hate me. So, anyway. Anyway. All right, so that's um, the marinated zucchini. And, um... Like I said, it's very delicious on pizza. It very, very, very delicious. Yes. Yes, I was just going to show you. Um, the Excalibur comes with, I couldn't remember all of a sudden, nine trays. Um, they come with these mesh inserts, okay? So this is how the Excalibur comes, nine trays with the mesh inserts. Excalibur makes these, they call them flex sheets. These, I, unfortunately, they do not come with them, and I think they're about $8 a piece. I don't know that I would buy one for every tray getting started, but I use these a lot. I really, nothing sticks to them. Um, where's my fruit leather? Hello, there you are. There's my fruit leather. Come on now, don't. Okay, see how nice that is? Um, so you just, it, it's really, really nice um, for your wetter fruits, your things that um, tend to dehydrate down. Your banana, like I, I went on and used it for the bananas. You could probably just put the bananas on here, but I'm going to tell you, remember, when you dehydrate, it sucks the water down and it sticks. One thing you can do, like the kale chips I've just done on here, you can just kind of wiggle it and it'll pop, pop off. So um, that's pretty nice, but I'm telling you, these... These sheets save your salvation. So, um, you're fixing to have one, so you just tell me. Um, again, it's going to depend on how much you dry them. Um, these are a little chewy inside. Again, the stuff you buy in the stores, dipped in sugar, freeze dried. You're not going to get that that potato chip crunch out of a heat dryer. Okay? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, don't ask me. That's of the tahini and the almond butter. Plus two tablespoons. One. I'm sorry. Does it not say cup? Oh, I'm sorry. It's one third a cup. And um, our tahini and our almond butter um, are organic. Well, our almond butter's not. The tahini is organic. Great, great products. So we have those for you to make your soy. Um, your Kale chips. Okay, let me. Another, okay, okay. Um, I think you probably could. Parchment liners. Could you use parchment paper? I would certainly try. I I think you could. Silicone. Yep. Mhm. Mm I would try it. I know that like saran is just hard to work on. Okay. You're gonna. You, at some point, I think you would love just having these designated. They're there, um, they're just, but like I said, I don't know that I would buy nine, you know, it's, you know cha-ching, cha-ching, but I would at least probably buy four um, until you start seeing what you're, you're going to dehydrate. Um, depends on, you know, how much, how much you're going to use. Okay, let's do, um, to grate your zucchini, see why I love um, the box grater, 
and I'll just put it out here and uh, just grate right on the tray. Oh, yes, the liners are reusable, and these are, I've had these since 2007. I mean, they're, they don't go anywhere, so once you buy them, it's not like they're going to wear out, get brittle, or anything like that. So there's my zucchini. I just spread it out, and like I said, um, in this cookbook here, she actually tells you, I believe, like a half a cup of dry is what you would use, rehydrated for a cup, or what, I may not have that right, but she tells you that. I find it's just easy to measure it here <laughs> and, and kind of label my little baggies. If I know, if there's a recipe I'm always making, um, so that's what I do. And you just want to see how I spread it out. You wouldn't want to, like, mound the zucchini up like that. Um, you do want to spread it out where a little bit so it gets a nice, nice airflow here. So there's, there's my zucchini. Carrots the same way. And um, just spread it out and go. So, I mean, there's, there's not a lot to teach you. Um, it's just however you want to use it. Um, the carrots, if you want to do the finer side or the zucchini, again, if that's the way you cut it in your recipe, then cut it like that before you dehydrate it. Even though this is going to look, I'll pass this around, this is going to look like fine grated after you dehydrate it. Um, but it's not, okay? So don't think, oh, it shrivels up. No, cut it like you want, like you would using it fresh, all right? All right. Um, did we pass? Did y'all, how'd y'all like the, the chips and the, uh, the zucchini chips are a little hot. I'm not sure. Um, there was an empty bag of one of the seasoning mixes, and I thought it was roasted red pepper. I think it might have been Roma is burning or some like it hot. It looked like roasted red. Y'all need water? We have water. See, this was all a ploy. We have water back there that's um, free or for a donation to Real Bread Outreach. So we have our bottled water back there if you like. Or we have free cups for you to get. But I'm um, sorry about that. I don't think it will taste as spicy. Like for pepperoni, I think it will be nice. To eat it like a chip, it's a little hot. Um, but uh, so even Caleb goes, uh, Mom, are you sure that was roasted red pepper? And I was like, well, there was a bag sitting here that the label had gotten torn off, and I thought I could tell because that, that it was roasted red. But I'm really thinking it was um, some like it hot or aroma is burning. So, um, so y'all are burning now. Sorry about that. All right. Your mouth is burning, yes. Um, so, all right. So there's our zucchini. And then I need to go ahead and get in the oven um, our bread. Well, I'll go ahead while I have this out, and I will show you the same with um, cucumbers. I love slicing cucumbers and dehydrating them. Yes? Yes? You can dehydrate diced potatoes. And funny thing about potatoes, in fact, I usually do them with my soup mix. She, her question is, can you di dehydrate diced potatoes? Yes, you can. And I don't blanch them or anything, and they turn gray. They are not pretty at all. In fact, the longer you they almost kind of get really ugly, kind of grayish, blackish. But something about, if you put them in an acid-based soup, they're white again. It's really, really funny because I was like, this is going to look gross in the soup. But when you put them in the, like vegetable soup or something like that, I don't know that I would, I don't know, I never tried them like with potato soup, a milk base. I always threw them in my, like my vegetable soup. Um, no, I thought that too. <laughs> Her question was, can you make potato chips? I thought, oh, we can surely do this. Uh, no, it, no. Uh, it's a raw, I mean, I guess unless you could figure out a way to cook the potato, but think about it, if you slice the raw potato and season it, it still tastes like a raw potato. <laughs> so there's some things that, no, mm -mm. Mm, yeah, no. Okay, um, I want to show you another valuable thing to have around when you're um, dehydrating vegetables is um, the veggie wash. It helps get the wax coating um, and pesticide residues and things like that off of your fruits and vegetables. Another thing that I'm um, a little more particular about, especially if I'm going to leave the skin on, and that is organic. Because think about it, you're concentrating. 
so you don't want to concentrate pesticides and things like that so I'm a little more particular um, about trying to get organic of course if you're growing it yourself it probably is but wow that cucumber smells good I'm getting hungry my little protein shake this morning was a long time ago um, so um, so I do use the veggie wash. I've already washed these, but just spray it on. If they're real waxy, like your apples and cucumbers, let it sit for a few minutes um, and, then, and then rinse and scrub. Another valuable tool, I have come to love these things, especially if you are gardening and you've got a lot of things to wash. If you take a scrub brush, by the time you're done scrubbing, your, your, hand, your fingers are just almost aching. Um, these are wonderful. <laughs> they're... Um, they're abrasive, mildly abrasive, and you just put them on, and we even have kid sizes. So if you've got kids helping you, you're gonna love these for potatoes. Like, I had to do 10 pounds of potatoes. Well, I didn't. I got my son to wash them, but um, it's great having children. They're convinced that's the only reason I had them was so they could do all my work for me. Yeah. Anyway, so these are nice and abrasive, and it's just almost like washing your hands. You just put the potato or the carrot, and I don't like to peel my carrots and things like that, but I do like to get a lot of that dirt off, but I don't want to peel all the skin off. So they're even nice for their smooth things like your cucumbers. They'll help get the wet, re the rest of that waxy um, film between that and your veggie wash. You'll love these if you, if you have a lot of a scrubbing and cleaning to do. So that's that. Um, cucumbers, again, I um, slice my cucumbers on this side here. And these, I'm not going to use um, separate. I'm not making chips. You could make delicious chips. You could, I think you could season them just like you just did the, um, the zucchini. And these would be great like that. Maybe with um, like Papa's Passion or the Garlic of Eaton or something like that, I think would be nice. But I'm going to use these um, to powder. So I dry them completely. And this, because I'm going to take them out and I don't care if they're all clumped, then I can just leave them piled up there to, you know, together. And I'm going to powder them. And now I have my own dip mix, and I'm going to serve you a creamy cucumber dip that I made by just adding a couple of tablespoons of this cucumber powder, a little squeeze of garlic, a little mayonnaise, a little uh, drained yogurt, and you've got an unbelievably creamy cucumber dip. Make salad dressing out of it. This was, this was in my cookbook, because this was one of the, we had cucumbers just coming in, coming in, and we were powdering everything. And I'm going to show you in a minute what I mean by powdering. And I fell in love with this, and I actually served this at one of my class or something event, I don't know what it was, but um, a pregnant lady was there, and she called me about three days later. She goes, all I'm thinking about is that cucumber dip. <laughs> she goes, I'm like craving it. So I was like, okay. So anyway, so um, that's that. So there's your um, vegetable tray here, your veggie wash. Um, all right. Yes? Not really. Um, and like I said, I would not mound those just like, you know, two inches deep. But you certainly don't have to lay, like if, like the zucchini chips, yes, we laid them in there individually. The, the cucumbers, I would just kind of spread them out. You know, just, they're going to take longer if you put a thicker, um, you know, layer there. And if you're drying them at a raw temperature, like 115, if you want them to be raw, then if you layer them too thick, then they're probably going to spoil before they get dry. So again, I would just think about what temperature you're drying at, you know, and all of that, okay? And it's really, I mean, this is not rocket science. I'm not kidding you. Nobody showed me how to dehydrate. I just started doing it. You literally just cut it, put it in there, go back. Is it dry? Is it not dry? Like my grapes today, actually, they need to be turned back on, and I'll probably, where are they? Always the last one. Um, actually, they're pretty good. Mmm. Never eat dry, dried food when you're doing a class. Yeah. This is bringing back, um, oh, yeah, the caramel. How many of y'all were here for the caramel icing event? That was a blooper. I decided to taste hot caramel icing on a cold refrigerated apple. 
And uh, yeah, I said, oh, it'd be great to dip apples in. I dipped it and took a bite and it stuck to the roof of my mouth, hardened, except it was still hot. So I was like, and I couldn't talk. I couldn't open my mouth for several minutes. So anyway, yeah, now I've got dried grape. Okay, um, I'll show you how to powder real quick. This is my dried cucumbers. See, I really don't care what they look like. If they're, and I'll even use my slicer shredder um, for cucumbers because I don't care that they're pretty slices. If I care that they're pretty slices, I will use the box grater so that I have a little more control um, over their size. You know what? I actually, since I have my blender that's already dirty with oranges, I'm going to just show you what I mean by powdering. Um, if you're going to powder things like tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchini, whatever, you could do the same with zucchini. You could do the same with the carrot, celery, and onion and make a, a vegetable dip, I, you know, using that. But all I do, here's my oranges that I dried, very, very dry. I don't worry about taking the seeds out. Seeds are healthy. So I just throw these in my blender. That one's not quite as dry as it probably should be. That's, that's what you want it to sound like if you're going to powder it. And the thinner you slice them, if you're going to powder it, the faster they will dry. So all I do is just put that dried product there. There you go. Now I've got orange zest <laughs> all times, whether I have oranges on hand to zest or not. The um, orange cranberry biscuits that you had when you came in, I added this orange powder to the dough and the orange butter. I added a couple of tablespoons of this powder to the, to the butter, sweetened it with just a little agave nectar, and that was your orange butter. The recipe is in your handout, what I did to the basic biscuit recipe. Isn't that wonderful? Um, go to the farmer's market, buy a case of lemons or limes. If your family likes lemons, limes, juice the lemons, <laughs> put that in the freezer, dry your skins, powder it, and then you've always got lemon zest. And I kind of take the pulpy part, you know, if I take the juice out, I'll take the pulpy part out. These, I just slice the oranges whole. These are great if you serve punch or water or tea, you want to just float these on the top, then they'll rehydrate, and they'll look very nice on your pitchers of punch or tea or water or whatever. Yes, sir? Not with, your, with the, the Sedona or the Excalibur dehydrator. You don't have to rotate trays. The fan is in the back, so it's blowing over all of them the same. No, no. Do I go in and turn the fruit? Oh, no, never. Mm -mm. I, don't. I don't. I don't fool with them at all. I put it in there. Goodbye. Done. Well. Either you need a new dehydrator or you need to ignore those directions. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it should, I've never turned anything, even with my Lequip. I've never, I never flipped things, um, ne never saw a need to. So, um, anyway, but I'll pass. This is absolutely heavenly smelling. Oh, man. Nice. I'll tell you what, I'll do another one on that side so you can just go up and down over here. Anywhere you would. Do Yes. Oh, yes. Potpourri, yes. Give it as gifts. Dry your flowers, your oranges, orange pieces, apple pieces, and give it as gifts, you know, to do this. It's just so fabulous. All right. So there's my orange zest. This, then now you got orange zest. I mean, I, lo I usually keep fresh oranges and things around, but sometimes I don't, and I want something orange so I can just powder um, my orange powder, and away I go. Yes, ma'am. Quarter horsepower. It's a try best personal blender. Love it. <laughs> I use this everything salad dressing, powdering, small amounts. Now, you'll see me use my bigger blender in a minute when I dry the powder the spinach. The tomatoes, 100 tomatoes, no, this wouldn't have done it. I'd use my big blender for that. But for small things and doing little bits at a time, um, because you're going to find this is going to clump up now um, very easily. Um, but 
So I don't usually do a lot of this at one time necessarily. I'll keep the oranges dry and um, just powder them as, as I need it. Yep. No, it should be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I use my... Um, yep. Mm -hmm. I use my blender attachment. I like this blender attachment to the... Um, the kitchen assistant, because it's not funnel shaped, a lot of times your, your wetter things like your oranges, your spinach and stuff that's real dry, it'll just powder and blow everywhere. But your orange powder, you'll see it kind of clumps a little bit. And a lot of times with your blenders that are um, kind of funneled down, it'll kind of get hot and clump down there because it just kind of stays down there. But most of the time, just a blender of any kind will work. Little food processor should work as well. So any type, any type of blade like that. All right, I wanna make for you um, the garden harvest bread. So what I did, I just grated, well, I don't need to shut that, Never mind. forget it. Um, I grated, I'm getting closed in here. I grated my apple, so if y'all wanna look at that recipe, it's in your handout. Possibly. Um, no, because I'm going to start putting something in it in just a few minutes. You could put this over there. No, that tray won't fit. Never mind. I meant to put it on the Sedona. That's okay. We'll be all right. All right. So y'all want to turn to the garden harvest bread recipe. I actually found this recipe in a fall magazine. Of course, it's got your carrots, your zucchini, and your apples. And I think I was just getting ready to do um, a dehydration class, and I saw that recipe, and I thought, wow, that would be really nice to dry those things when you've got them coming in in the garden and then have them ready um, to make your bread with. So I just dehydrated um, a carrot, an a apple, and the zucchini, and I measured my amounts there, and then I just um, went ahead and just put it in a bag. So if for that recipe, because I really, really like this recipe, so I know I'll be making it, you know, a lot. Um, like I said, you can kind of start figuring out what a half a cup of raw zucchini looks like dried. It's not very much. That's a half a cup of zucchini, half a cup of carrot, and half a cup of, of um, apple. So that's a whole apple, um, about a half a zucchini, and one whole carrot. I measure before I dry. Like I said, she gives you some, some um, equivalents in her book of what you need to do dry to rehydrate with a cup of water to get your, um, to get your amounts there. <coughs> now, what's so nice about dehydrating is this is going to rehydrate. And um, if I want to use this raw, like if I want to grate carrots and dry them and then I'm going to use them as a, in a raw you know, raw carrot like in a salad or something like that, you're going to want to rehydrate them with ice water. If you're going to cook with them, then just go ahead and use hot water. So um, that's what I'm going to do. And I am doubling this recipe so we'll have enough for everybody to get some, not run out. And um, so I'm going to just put my two bags here. This is um, the vegetables for two recipes of the garden harvest bread. And I'm boiling my water here, and I actually don't need it to totally boil, and it's hot. So now I'm going to just pour my water. And there's, it doesn't really matter. I think she gives you some specific um, measurements. What I generally do is just pour water over it till it's covering it, and then just let it sit here. Once it rehydrates, it's going to soak up pretty much all that it's going to soak up, and then I just drain the water off. So um, that's what I'll do. So I'll just, and it needs to sit for about 15 minutes. So um, while that's sitting, I'll go ahead and mix up the bread here. So I've got, I'm doubling the recipe. So I've got three cups of soft wheat flour, my cup and a half of my honey granules. I think you could certainly use honey here instead of the honey granules. I would just cut the amount in half. I'd maybe use a half a cup of honey. Um, that's not exactly half, but it's pretty close. And then I'm going to, um, this is my soda and my salt. This is my cinnamon. And this is my nutmeg. I'm 
wire whisk. This is an easy, easy recipe to make. Buttermilk. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get my buttermilk out. I actually was going to use kefir here. I've got my kefir over there, but Caleb didn't want me to use his good kefir. He wants y'all to taste it in a little while. So, like, okay. Absolutely. I use kefir now for buttermilk all the time because it's so easy to make. And I'm going to show you. You're sitting there going, what? I'm going to show you how to make kefir when I make the yogurt. But I absolutely use kefir. That's why this was all the way in the back of the refrigerator because I really don't use the buttermilk anymore. It's just so much cheaper to make the kefir, and I've got it on hand all the time. Yes. 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 Um, good question. You may be losing some. I wouldn't think a lot. I mean, yes, it colors the water, but this is soaking up the water, not letting out the water. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think you're going to lose as much as as you would like if you thaw, like you freeze the stuff and thaw it, you lose all that natural water that's already that's there. You know what I'm saying? Good question though. I I really never thought about that. Y'all think of so many things that I don't think of. I mean, y'all go way beyond. Okay, so I'm just um, mixing my oil, my buttermilk and my eggs. This is just a basic quick bread recipe, but I just wanted you to see, wanted to do it in front of you um, so that you could see how rehydrating the vegetables there. And if I were didn't have all my ingredients measured out, about the time that I have everything, mill my flour, get all my other ingredients, that's going to be be ready. It probably could stay a little longer. Um, ice water if you're going to use the, the vegetable or whatever raw. Okay. If you're going to cook it, go ahead and use warm water. Or you can use anything, but go ahead and use warm water. So, all right. So, that was my everything but my dried vegetables. So I'm just going to go ahead and stir this in. Oh, I think it actually said to stir in the apple and the zucchini and stuff into the flour. I don't think it really matters. Remember, it's a suggestion. <laughs> Recipes are suggestions. Um, you can actually do the muffins whenever you're ready. Yep. Um, I made for you the chocolate zucchini muffins, and these are this is just my basic muffin recipe that I added um, rehydrated, dehydrated. That's a funny way to say it. rehydrated, dehydrated zucchini. You could of course use fresh zucchini here, but um, I have it dehydrated. And then I added, I did use the banana that was optional, and I think these recipes are on page. Uh, yeah, the next page from the garden, page six. This is the carrot cake oatmeal recipe is here. And then this is the chocolate zucchini muffins. I'm assuming you have a red cookbook. So that's what you're going to change. My basic muffin recipe, you're just going to add these. Yes. If you're going to go ahead and use fresh rather than dehydrated. Uh-huh. Uh, some recipes recommend that you basically squeeze all the water out of the Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, if... If you if the recipe says to do that, I would either do that or cut down on some of the liquid in the recipe. Okay. See, this is a little stiffer dough here, and more moist. Whatever. Yeah. It, 
if you if the recipe tells you to pat it dry I would certainly pat it dry it's got enough liquid in there what I find I don't usually do all that <laughs> what I find is it just usually if if I find that the batter's a little too thin then I might just add a little more flour but what I usually find is adding that extra moisture just may may, may take it cook a, may make it cook a little longer um, you just need to play with the recipe there yes You know, I just don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, use it raw. I don't know. Most thing that I've rehydrated is carrots, and they come out really, really nice. So I just don't know. I've never tried the, um, the well, I have rehydrated the squash, and you're right, it is a little spongy, but then I wasn't going to eat it raw. Um, I, I, I just don't know. I think I would try cold water if you want to try it again, okay? So see how I kind of, it, it's soaked up a, a good bit of the liquid there, and I'll just um, drain it, which, um, Sharon, could you go get my uh, tea strainer, you know, the, <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, it should be in, to the left right there in the door. On the bottom shelf, Maggie, one of the strainers with the handle. This is the hardest class to do because just everything is everywhere. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put in my nuts. There we go. That's what I need. Yep, just this one will be great. Thank you. And then I'm going to just. And if you think you're losing, you know, if you were concerned about the nutrients, you could always use this as some of the liquid um, in something else that you're cooking. Okay, so see. There's my rehydrated. And see how my, it looks really almost like I just grated it. See the carrot? So there's that. And I'm going to just stir this in. I love this bread. It's really good. It's really good with the fresh produce or it's really good with the dehydrated. And it takes about 45 minutes to cook. So what time are we supposed to be done? One? Whew, I better get with it. Is it two? Usually they give me till two. <laughs> Some are saying one. Is it one? Ten to one? Okay. We'll get there. <laughs> oh, you know me too well. Okay, so this is double, so I'm just dividing this into my loaf pans. These are my USA pans. I love them, love them, love them. Huh? Why do I love them? Because they're truly, truly nonstick. No, I don't spray at all. The stuff actually comes right out, even cakes, the cake pan. Um, and I find the bread, it's funny, I've, I've put bread in one of these and bread in another pan. The bread in this rows better. I, don't ask me why. No, you don't want to let stuff, like, I, you don't want to take this bread out and just let it sit in the pan. Just like a cake, you know, you let a cake cool about 10 minutes in the pan so it sweats. You let it go longer than that, it hardens into the pan. Um, I don't find that to be quite as big a deal with these, but nonetheless, yes, I've, I've left muffins and, yeah, they didn't come out because they harden. But if you do them like you're supposed to do them, they'll be just fine. Okay, there's my garden harvest bread. because they're coated with silicone. <laughs> oh, you're so clever. Um, okay, here's my oven. And they're called USA because guess where they're made? USA. Gotta love it. All right, how long do we cook this bread? Right, we'll have this for you. 40 to 50? All right, we'll do, we'll do 45. How about that? Hello. Okay. All righty. Let's see. Let me go down my list and see what I've done here. We've done the vegetables. We've done the carrot, celery, and onion. Ceramic knife is wonderful, wonderful for cutting. Um, you serve the dip with the carrots. 
Okay, you want to do that? All right, why don't you work on that while he works on the muffin? Um, this is my creamy cucumber dip, and that recipe is actually in my red cookbook, okay? And that's where I dried the cucumbers and powdered them and then used that as a base for my salad dressing. Yes, ma'am. No, don't be sorry. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Um, it's gonna thicken. It's gonna thicken stuff up. So you you either got to use a little more liquid. Watch what you're doing. Yeah, I'm gonna make a smoothie for you um, out of. Where's my basket? Let me finish going through my basket here so I can show you what I did. Here's my spinach that I dehydrated. Takes hour, two hours, depending on how thick you mount it up. This is one thing you can pile on up. I powdered it. A tablespoon of this powder is one cup of fresh spinach. I don't know. I haven't totally read that one, but I'm telling you, okay? <laughs> a tablespoon. Guess what I do with this? Throw it in soup, stew, rice, omelets, pasta, tortillas. Oh my gosh, put it in tortilla dough. But the most fun thing, and this is what I'm gonna make for you, is a Shrek smoothie. For your kids, pineapple, banana, tablespoon of spinach powder. Yeah, they have a, a cup of spinach right there in the morning. If, the, if they don't like the green stuff, you know, they don't go for Hulk or Shrek or anything like that, then use dark berries like the mixed um, frozen raspberry blueberry mixture. They'll never see it. Never see it, never taste it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what we did. We kind of did some little tests like this so we could figure it out, and we figured out that a cup of, of the spinach powder. Here's my squash, okay? And that it, I cut it for squash casserole, and that's the way it looked. You would want to soak this, rehydrate it, and then use it just like you would fresh squash in your casserole. Um, this is celery. Um, this is flax chips, uh, crackers that are in your book. We could actually serve these. I might do that at the end. And then, um, what was the other thing I wanted to show you? Hmm. I just was fixing to show you the, okay, you had the kale chips. You liked those, right? Oh, man, it'll come to me in a minute. I just had a little senior moment there. All right, let's do some of our fruits. Get my table cleaned up here. Here's where you're going to probably want a nice blender. I love my Mega Blender for doing fruit leathers. Um, how many of y'all buy fruit roll-up for your kids? Nasty. There's not hardly any fruit there. Um, all kinds of other stuff. Well, look what you can do. I can never. This is uh, one package of strawberries. And this is just one idea. Um, in one of my healthy eating simplified classes, one of the last ones I did was a fruit salad that I used a yogurt mixture over the top and um, just stirred it in. And I had bananas and pineapple and things like that in it. Well, I thought I would take the leftovers home. And when I did, the bananas had turned dark. The, no, my Latvian boys, no. They're not eating dark food because they want to know how old it is and all this kind of stuff. And even my, well, my daughter's allergic to bananas, but they, kids are not going to eat dark fruit. I just don't know what it, you know, the apples can sit there and they ate them this morning, but now they've turned brown. Nobody's going to eat them. Throw them in the blender. <laughs> and I took that fruit salad, even with the yogurt all over it, pureed it, spread it out, and made fruit leather out of it. Absolutely delicious. Dried it at a low temperature, so even my organisms were saved. So this was a probiotic and a fruit roll-up. So. Um, all I'm going to do is this is my one package of strawberries. Might not use the whole thing. That might be a little too much. One package of blueberries. And I even got to where I would freeze fruit to make um, 
fruit leathers with if I had an abundance of it and didn't have time right then to do it. But grapes make great addition. Um, and just blend it. And then I'm going to add just a little bit of sweetener to this. And I'm going to use honey. You could use agave nectar. I, I like to use honey where honey will work, and I find honey works just fine here. I'm using about two tablespoons because I don't find the strawberries are quite as sweet or they weren't. let it get nice and liquefied. Now I'm going to take my tray here and I don't do a lot of washing on my trays unless I've had onions or something like that on here. I may just give them a little white or beef jerky if I've had that on here. Did y'all have the beef jerky? Okay. Oh, I forgot. That's what I needed to tell you how to make the beef jerky. Yep. I knew I was forgetting some. And I like about a cup. I think a cup does a really nice job of um, making the fruit leather for this size. Um, uh oh, there was a blob. And what I do is I kind of pour it here. And here's what my son taught me how to do. I used to spread it with a spatula. Get that little hunk out of there. These you do not. Um, the Lequip that's plastic, those you have to you have to spray with a little spray. But these you do not. Um, the ones in the Sedona, yes you do. Yeah, you have to you have to oil those. Th that's why I love these um, these leather trays so much. I mean these uh, sheets. So there's my fruit leather. And it'll take your fruit leathers will take about five hours, depending on how thick, of course, um, you put it. And then where did it go? Where did it go? Ah, there it is. About five hours. If you over dry these, they'll, they're brittle. Okay. Now, one trick, if they're not too dry, if it's humid, you can just turn the dehydrator off and just let them sit there. Maybe out, if your dehydrator's outside and it's a rainy day, they'll, they'll get moisture in them. So also know that, that some things like tomatoes, You'll get them really dry. If you're going to powder your tomatoes, you might want to go ahead and do it uh, right after you dry them because they'll reabsorb and get a little soggy and won't powder as nicely. But here's my fruit leather. This is about a cup of this mixture. And then there's my fruit leather. And you can just roll it up, cut it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was powder the fruit and use it in your yogurt, use it in a smoothie. I mean, this is just fruit, and it'll rehydrate, okay? So there's my, my fruit leather. You can cut it in pieces. And that, um, I believe that container of strawberries and package of blueberries, if you did that, I think it made three of these big fruit leathers. You are. You are. I have them. She, she knows what she's doing. Here you go. Here's the, here's the ones I made for you. And I did double that, and so it made all of those. All right? You would pay lots of money for this, and you're getting lots of chemicals. So there's that. Here's the pineapple. Brad's going to show you how to cut pineapple in just a minute. And um, we have some grapes here. These are dried grapes. I cut my grapes in half and just lay them in the dehydrator. So I'm going to let them serve you the, um, the fruit here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Have I ever done cranberries? They're terrible. <laughs> um, they took a very long time to dry, and I didn't, I just didn't believe that you really, really had to sweeten them. And yeah, they were pretty bad. Um, so you do need to sweeten them. Um, that is one thing I'd probably still just buy cranberries, <laughs> especially ours that are, that are juice infused instead of all the sugar. So those are nice. The other thing that I don't do is blueberries. 
um, right after one of my dehydration classes. Or no, the lady didn't come to a class. She just saw the dehydrator. Her, I, I don't know. She bought a dehydrator and she called me and said, I hate this dehydrator. Can I bring it back? And I was like, well, you know, and I was fixing to have a class. I said, why don't you come to the class first? And I said, well, what do you hate about it? She said, I did blueberries and they took forever. And I'm like, yeah, that's the least. No, I hate blueberries. Don't I'm in the dehydrator. Freeze them. <laughs> because the way to get them to dry, cut them in half. Well, I'm not going to sit there and cut a little blueberry in half. Well, then if you don't cut them in half, that skin is so kind of thick on there it takes days for those babies to dry and then they're very seedy um, I mean I guess they would rehydrate but uh -uh, there's just some things you're gonna find I, I'm sure they did blueberries years ago but I just didn't enjoy them so I freeze my blueberries and um, anyway so there's there's the fruit leather in fact I actually made this extra one so I'll give this over here for you to start on the fruit leather. Strawberries are nice um, and, and rehydrate them to use. Yes, they're very nice. I would slice them probably. Or again, however you want to use this, you know, um, that's what I would do. Yes. Um, these sheets are too big for this, um, the, the Sedona, but if you wanted, I really like these sheets and someone came in just really upset about the sheets for the Sedona the stuff just won't come off you have to spray it um you would have to cut them to fit but I think you could you certainly could um, but the thing about the Lequip with the fan from the bottom on your fruit leathers you can only do every other tray you know you, you stagger them you do one on this side one on this side one on this side um, before I forget to go over the, um, I've already told you about the Excalibur. This was kind of the, the grandfather or whatever of dehydrators for the serious raw foodie, um, serious dehydrators are gonna, um, people that dehydrate, hippies, whatever, are gonna love, you know, the Excalibur has been around for a long, long time. The Sedona, this dehydrator over here, um, is made by Tribest, and um, they actually took all the customer um, suggestions on this dehydrator and put them in that dehydrator. A prettier box, it's a little sturdier built, a glass window, that, something that would look pretty on your counter. It has two fans in it, so it dries very quickly. Also, it's very efficient. There's a, it comes with a tray that you can put in there that will block, like, like box off it fan so you can turn one fan on if you're only doing a small amount has a nighttime mode and they actually tested it and found that it was within one degree plus or minus of the temperature that it actually said it was they tested all other dehydrators and found that there was a lot of discrepancy especially once you once you filled it so anyway um, so you will um, love a blender I'm gonna let them finish that's Brad. What can I say? Um, I'll let Brad, uh, not Brad, but Caleb or somebody later finish the, um, the fruit leathers here. I'll just put them back here. But the Sedona comes with these plastic trays and these plastic inserts there. Um, no, not, I didn't spray this one. But when you do the fruit leathers, the plastic um, inserts that you buy for the fruit leathers, um, you have to spray those or, or it sticks really badly. So I would almost use um, something like this. All right. It's a little bigger in size. Um, yes, this, this has a larger capacity, the Excalibur. And um, it is $209, and that one is $369. So, I mean, you pay for the quality of that one and what you get. Um, it is really, really a very nice dehydrator. And it would be definitely for the enthusiast. The beans are done, so you're going to let the pressure, he's going to let the pressure come down, and then he'll pull the jars out, and the lids will actually seal um, as they cool. Oh, man, I did not do that.
was going to use that for something else. <laughs> Um, it's in my red cookbook. Yeah, it's in the in the back where the dehydrated food things is. It's there. Again, it's very difficult to tell you times on dehydration. I think the Excalibur has in it has an owner's manual that tells you some times and temperatures and things like that. Again, it's going to depend on how much moisture is in that apple, how much moisture is in that tomato, how thick you slice it, how if you do it outside how wet it is outside, okay? Um, now, I have this mixer. It has, this is my um, kitchen assistant. I love the slicer shredder attachment because when you're doing a lot of food, you can put this attachment in. Well, and then I just have the pan, the tray sitting right there. And I just grate the apple or whatever I'm doing, zucchini, cucumber. Brad, you want to come up here in just a minute? I'm going to let you show them how to do the apples. Now, for grated apples, for like to use as muffins or that bread, I just cut. and just feed it through the grater. And I just put the tray right there. If you're doing a lot of things, like uh, a lot of carrots, a lot of zucchini, you can just grate it right out onto the tray and just spread it out as it comes out. I find with apples, the tartar the apple, like your Granny Smith, um, it doesn't turn as dark. Okay. Also, though, I have noticed with these dehydrators that dehydrate um, more quickly that you don't get as uh, much oxidation. So there I just spread that out and dry it. Um, again, apples, if I'm going to use them grated, like in muffins and things like that, just grate it. If I want it for apple pie, slice it just like you would you want the size of it. If you're going to peel it, if you're going to use a fruit peeled, then peel it. Before. So just prep it just like you would be if you were fixing to put it in that pie. Brad's going to show you the slicer, core, peeler, whatever. Um, if you just do an apple slices and you don't have one of these gizmos, I just slice and I, um, I do the core and everything. There's nothing wrong with the core. You can eat it. Nothing wrong with apple seeds, but the seeds, once they're dry, will just pop right out. So I don't even core them if I'm, if I'm doing for slices. But Brad will show you the slicer core. What I love about this one is it's a, a suction cup instead of having to clamp to your countertop. And um, it just works very, very well. And then you don't have to worry about screwing it onto a lip on your counter because I don't have a lip on my counter at home. You on? No. I can get it. Okay. Um, let me tell you, I got, I got a funny story to tell you. And I got to show you my product, my new gadget that I found in Chicago this year. And I bought them just for you for this class. This is so fabulous. Um, when I, we first started dehydrating, my family lives in South Georgia and we would go down there and we'd go through Vidalia. So we were coming through in the summer. And we thought, why not buy a 50-pound bag of Vidalia onions? Can you tell that we don't do anything small scale? I mean, when you have nine people in your family, 11 now, you just don't, 23 if all of us are together. Um, anyway, we don't do anything small scale. So Brad and I bought 50-pound bag of Vidalia onions that you saw, 1998. And one Sunday afternoon, we had come home from church, and I was napping. The kids were just doing whatever kids do. And Brad was restless, and so he decided he would get started on the onions. So he hooked up the slicer shredder, 
and he actually had built had made this little board so it would hang over the counter the the leg of the of the mixer and he put a bucket underneath so he could just grate the Vidalia onions right into that bucket and then I think he was thinking all the kids were going to help spread these onions out. The next thing I know, oh, don't be me. I am back in my room with the door shut and I'm like, man, my eyes were just started burning, like burning like crazy. And um, one of my kids comes and goes, mom, what is that? My eyes are burning. And um, so we go in the kitchen and there's Brad grating 50 pounds of Vidalia onions. It was so volatile that we were just crying. Great way to get the kids to all go outside on a Sunday afternoon. You should have seen them. We have glass, you know, halfway up our door. They were all standing there. Are you all done yet? And we were like, no. But the thing that was so funny is my ingenious son over here, he decided to go into the ski crate and get us some ski goggles. And so we could put the ski goggles on. So there Brad and I are on this Sunday afternoon. We look like aliens and there were ski goggles grating our 50 pound bag of onions. Did we ever buy ski goggles? Nope, we haven't needed yeah, to. Yeah, we have, we did. We, have we? We have, we've done oh, it Oh, we twice. did it a second year. Look what I found when I was in Chicago. Onion goggles. <laughs> so, I'm ready. So, I, so if you're gonna do onions, onion goggles. Well, even if you chop a lot of onions at home and if they really, really bother you, if you have contacts or something like that, um, great. I, I just, I thought they were fabulous. They all laughed at me and I'm like, you've never done 50 pounds of onions. <laughs> now, here's the deal. You must dry onions outside. We filled four dehydrators with the 50 pounds of onions and um, we put them outside and, the, and we did them that Sunday afternoon. They were still drying the next day. Brad used to drive an old Ford pickup truck, had no air conditioning and it was summertime. He came, the, the road coming up to our house is about a quarter of a mile long before you get to our road. The dehydrators were all under the carport. He said as soon as he turned on that road, he could smell us. <laughs> he said, it smelled like the county fair, you know, or varsity or something. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? I mean, it was like onion. And uh, we smelled for days, days. So that is my Vidalia onion story. But they're fabulous to have on hand and dry when they're um, in season and um, just get you some goggles. <laughs> I think you'll love the goggles if you really, I, onions really, certain ones really, really bother me. And if you're chopping a lot, um, have at it. In fact, I'm going to use those. We're catering my son's wedding and we're making coleslaw. Whose perfect. idea was that? Yours. <laughs> anyway, show, why don't you show them this apple peeler core slicer? Your nose is getting longer. Uh-oh, you just lost it. There we go. I got it. Got your back. All right, I've got this thing fastened down to the counter. That thing works pretty, pretty good, too. Anyway, there's a little lever right here that I'm going to pull towards me. It's going to release this. I'll pull this all the way back. Speak up. Then I'm going <clears> to, <throat> i tell you what, why don't you do the talking and I'll do this. That's what know. you do best. I don't know how this works. I'm, I'm mechanically challenged. You always do this for me. Okay. Yeah, oh, Brad, Brad usually tells you he's discovered. <laughs> he's discovered how to, I've discovered how to cut an onion without shedding a tear. Get him to do it. But now I have goggles. I've replaced you with goggles. Goggles. I'm so glad. Thank you. And look, Thank you. and you got the orange memo. They're both in orange. All right. Go ahead, Brad. Great Show. minds think alike. I know. And then you just turn it. Wow, that's cool. Now. It's because it's not there yet. It's coming. Okay. Oh, you lift it up. There, there we go. All right. Now, that this little, little piece right here, well, let me pull that back. This right here is going to peel it. This piece, as it pushes it through, is going to core it and slice it at the same time. If so. you don't want it peeled, you just, just pull this back out and of the it, way. Yeah, it locks down. So if you don't, if you want the peel on, which if you're dehydrating it for powder, guess what? Dehydrated apples, powder them, sprinkle it on oatmeal. You don't need to buy that apple nasty package. You know, make some oatmeal and there you have it. Boom, Booja, You're good at that. It just takes one slice, 
Oh, that's a ring. And if you want for pie, two slices. There you go. Okay? How cool is that? Handy tool. Like I said, don't take a lot of equipment for dehydrating, but if you're going to do a lot, there's some things that just really make life wonderful. And these aren't expensive. They're not terrible. And what do you do with all this peel? Dry it, powder it, put it on your, um, put it on your, what am I trying to say? Oatmeal or whatever, in muffins. Put it in your ooey gooey bread. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, I just don't know. I wonder if well, I have I a potato. I don't see why not. I don't see why not. We could certainly try. Well, except it's going to shoot it through the core. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. All right. Pineapple. Um, and now while we're, while Brad's up here, I'm going to get him to show you the pineapple slicer. This just needs to be rinsed. I'll do it up here. This is a mini pearl pineapple. Oh, the tag's still on? Makes a great hat. Well, you just go right ahead and knock yourself out. <laughs> Doesn't match my outfit. Okay. You need this? Indeed. All righty. Just going to cut the top off. Somebody told me you could. Yeah. That it works? Um, hey, Caleb, did you give them bananas? I didn't give them bananas. Sorry, Brad. Um, planting the top of the pineapple and it'll grow. Oh, that's, you're still working on And it makes how many pineapples? There's that too. That's what I thought. This is I the pineapple cutter. Should be. Yeah. We do have them in stainless steel and we have well, them in plastic as well. You just place that in the middle, push down, and turn. Isn't that cool? Actually, I can uh, do both sides and then they come right off. And then if you want rings, you can do the rings or I usually, I usually cut mine in chunks. Kind of like that for my pieces. And that's what y'all are fixing to have. A pineapple piece, a grape, a banana, and a fruit leather. Okay? All the fruity things. All right? So, we'll get these cut real quick here and spread them out. And then we will move on. Actually, I may save this for the Shrek smoothie that I'm going to make, y'all. Who wanted the top? Oh, nobody. How long do you think um, overnight. Oh, a long time. Yeah, if you get them good and dry. Now, um, like those pineapples been there for months. Hey, Karen. <laughs> what y'all fixing to eat? So, um. And I ate them yesterday. They were delicious. So really, right, yeah, I mean, yeah. As long as you dry them, get them good and dry, okay? Honestly, I've not had anything but the Vidalia onions be a storage issue because it usually gets eaten before 
I mean, as fast as I can make it, they, my kids will eat this. So, did you have a question? Oh, wow. You mean you use that as a cup or as a container? No. you. Oh, wow. Did you? Digestion. Okay. Okay, so what you're saying, you take this and you put it in water and boil it. Wash it. Oh, okay. All right. So you, okay, I got you. Okay, so you wash it really well, and then you put this in boiling water, and you basically steep it, you know, make a tea, let this um, infuse the water, and then you drink the water. And it's very good for digestion and for kidneys. Wow. Okay, she's saying if you don't want to boil it, you can just put it in cool water and wait three days, and it'll ferment, and it'll start bubbling, and then you mix it with a little honey and flour. Wow. Wheat flour and make a drink. Wow. Man, you need to teach some classes here. That is fabulous. Okay, so I'm going to put this out on my dehydrator tray. And then I'm just going to put it in my dehydrator. So. <laughs> this is very hard to do this way. Oops, there we go. And then all you do to turn the Excalibur on you just put the tray, the door here, it just latches on, and you just turn it on. I'm going to put these in the other dehydrator because I don't, they'll, they'll mix all right with the fruit. They're, they're not that potent. Like, I wouldn't put onions in here with the fruit, but they're okay. Okay, so there's that. All righty. Pumpkin. I, that's what I was going to tell you about, pumpkin. I thought about pumpkin when I did fruit leathers one time, and I'm like, okay, so I buy whole pumpkins and I cut, cook them down. Why can't I um, make like a fruit leather out of it and then powder it, and then I've got pumpkin all year long? Because have you noticed a lot of the pumpkin, uh, canned pumpkin people, they've quit selling pumpkin during the year. You can only get it seasonally. Well, I was going to do pumpkin for you, but they don't even have them in the grocery store now. So I couldn't um, do that to show you, but I did. I think it's actually in my fruit basket. So this, I made a, I just spread it out, made it like after I cooked it and pureed it, spread it out like a fruit leather. And I measured because I have like I add a cup of pumpkin to my muffins, a cup of pumpkin to my pancakes. So I thought I'm going to do the fruit leathers a cup at a time. So I just did it like that. You can either just leave it like this and put it in a bowl and rehydrate it with hot water, or I powdered it. I let it get really dry and I powdered it. And now an eighth of a cup of this powder is one cup of pumpkin. After I, re I just put it in water and I kept letting it soak up the water until it was the consistency that I wanted it to be. Okay? So that's a great thing to do in the fall. <laughs> I freeze, I still freeze pumpkin, but I love drying it like this because then you've got it in just a small amount, you know, small space. 
great way to do baby food fully cook your baby food puree it spread it out like a fruit, fruit leather powder it then all you got to do if you're traveling or at a restaurant just say can I have some hot water or even water and just rehydrate it um, so so easy um, here's my apples that Brad like he just sliced um, these were the sliced with the peel on these were diced with the peel on um, here's my coconut and here's the pineapple oh here's the fruit leather that I told you about that I did with the um, the yogurt the fruit salad that had the yogurt and everything on it so that's that one all right any questions yes You could. I mean, I don't know that I would go to all that trouble if you already have it frozen. I don't know that I would, you know, thaw it out. But you certainly could if you want, but I don't. I wouldn't. I've already done that. I'd just leave it in there and then next year powder it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we just did. The, the blueberries? Yeah, that's what you had with strawberry and blueberry. Yeah, that's what that fruit leather that's coming around right now. That's what you had. Okay. Um, I do it, I do the coconut with, with this, with the slicer, you know, my attachment, because it's just easy, because uh, it's so hard, she's asking me what I grate my coconut with, that I'm a little scared to, to box grate it, because that box grater's, um, you know, pretty sharp, so I just use my grater so I can just drop it in, yes. Um, the, to process the pumpkin, I just cut my pumpkin, left the skin on, scraped the seeds out. And I'll tell you the best tool to scrape those seeds out, grapefruit spoon. <laughs> um, it's got the little serrations right here. Just scrape those seeds out and get most of the stringy stuff. Then I pressure cook my pumpkin. Put it um, about that much water in the bottom of my regular pressure cookers that I cook with. Pile my pumpkin in there with the skin and, you know, the skin and everything. And I believe is it 10 minutes and then just let the pressure come down oh no I take that back if it's a small enough pumpkin you can um, just put the whole pumpkin in there and pressure it I, I don't remember now how long it is but I'll try to find out for you I can't I can't remember and um, it's fabulous and then just let the pressure come down and you can cut it open and clean it out and then I just puree it in the blender either way I do it I just puree it in the blender it doesn't need any water added to it it's it's steamed and fully cooked and then I just did just like I did the fruit leather cup at a time I just spread it out yeah well a cooking pumpkin for your pies and and cooking with yes mm-hmm all right oh wow that smells that oh it's the bread smelling I'm like wow that stuff smells good in there oh well I never set the timer hmm I said it, but I never pushed the start button. Let me check. So I hope it's not burned. Wow, how's that for perfect timing? Maybe let it go a couple more minutes. Okay. All right, let's make some yogurt how about that and then we'll make smoothies and y'all can have the bread and you had the carrot the celery dip did you like that isn't that nice and just the, the freshness of that flavor and um, oh yeah 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 beef jerky sorry about that um, the recipe that I use for the beef jerky is in my book and it, actually the directions are here um, but I'll go over it with you I, you know, you can do, uh, venison jerky is very, very good because venison is very lean. Um, I don't use the, there's a lot of, like online you'll see jerky mixes and, and makers and they use ground meat that you then like shoot it through a, a press. I use meat, you know, and I find that a London broil is a really nice cut of meat for your beef jerky. You typically find it about that, cut about that thick just a nice size and it's a leaner cut of meat that's not real expensive I mean it's not like the ribeyes and and other things but it's a leaner cut of meat and I find that it makes really really good jerky 
what I've discovered, to slice it thin, I just use a nice sharp knife, and I love my ceramic knives, but if you will put it in the freezer and let it almost freeze, you'll be able to slice um, nicely. My son, I used to put it in the freezer and freeze it and then take it out and let it partially thaw. And my son kept, the last time we made jerky, he kept saying, don't you want to put this roast in the freezer so it'll, and, and take, so we can take it out in a little while? To, I'm like, no, no, no. Well, he likes to partially freeze his and take it out, and I completely freeze mine and let it partially thaw. Well, it finally hit me this week. I know why he likes that way. If you let it freeze, it freezes from the outside in. So if you take it out before it's completely frozen, the outside is frozen. If you freeze it completely and take it out and let it partially defrost, the outside is squishy, or, or it's defrosted. You can still slice nicely. So either way, if you totally forget it, and then you have to take it out and let it, let it thaw a little bit, you'll be all right. But that's the better way is to put it in the freezer, let it almost freeze, and then you can slice nice thin slices. Then you make the marinade, pour it over it, let it sit overnight, and then just put your strips in. I find that you do need to dehydrate your meat at about 145 um, so that it, it dehydrates before it spoils. If you try to do it at a lower temperature, you're probably not going to get good results. Let me get the bread out. Okay. Oh, okay. That's good. Or you did check it? Okay, there's our harvest bread. Can you get me? Yeah, there we go. Just put it right there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just assumed it was for me. What are y'all laughing at? What did he say? There's no, never mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can only imagine. How were the muffins, the chocolate zucchini muffins? I always worry about this class a little bit because it's not a typical bread Becker's eating class. So it's kind of like, well, we're not really serving that much food. Okay. The temperature on the pressure canner, the pressure has dropped. So now he's going to use the jar lifter to lift the jars out and sit them on a cooling rack. Yeah, that, is that rack okay? Okay. And then now as they'll cool, you'll actually hear the lids pop and they're, and they're sealing. So, all right, let's get to making our yogurt. Did I finish? I finished the beef jerky, right? Okay. The only thing I didn't do was I didn't spiralize the zucchini for you. I was, but that's not really a dehydration thing. I just, you know me, I have to throw in something extra. Um, crackers and tortillas and croutons. Oh my goodness. Those are fabulous to do in the dehydrator because you don't have to worry about them burning at all. So what I do with my bread or uh, tortilla wrappers, I just baste them with a little bit of the olive oil dipping sauce that we make with the garlic and the Italian seasoning, little salt, cut them in triangles, or if it, I'm doing croutons, cut them in cubes, pop them in the dehydrator and just let them go, you know, five or six hours. Wonderful chips or croutons or um, one, one Christmas. I, I hate crackers. You can't find a really, really, truly whole grain cracker. And so I made little baguettes and I sliced it, you know what I'm talking about, um, the small baguettes are about this big around, and I sliced it in little rounds and basted it with the olive oil um, dipping sauce and a little, put a little salt on there and dried the rounds and then used that like for one of my dips or cheese ball or whatever. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. So those are great fun things that you can do. You wanna come up here? Well, turn yourself on. Hello, there we oh, go. Oh, there you go. Okay. This water in here is still boiling. Mm -hmm. You see it bubbling? That's why you want to use this. It's very hot. Um, well, uh, I guess I was going to make yogurt. <laughs> what are you missing? Uh, my milk. Oh, okay. 
Uh, hmm. Where? Oh, there it is. Oh, good, and he didn't use it all. All right, so we're going to make some yogurt now. Um, we sell several yogurt makers, and all the yogurt maker is is an incubator. That's all it is. It's just a way to keep um, the yogurt, the milk, warm. Yogurt, the organisms that culture yogurt or ferment or the probiotics, whatever you want to say, those bacteria and organisms, they like warm and they have to stay at about 115 degrees or they're not going to grow. Um, your kefir organisms, on the other hand, can grow at room temperature. So your yogurt organisms, you're going to need to heat your milk. And where's Caleb? Do you want to make a smoothie out of your kefir? Okay, well let me show him how to make um, another batch first. Okay, Caleb is the kefir man. He ferments everything. <laughs> um, here's the nice thing about the kefir. I'm looking for my starter. Here it is. This is the kefir starter that we carry. And all these years, even as a food microbiologist, I thought kefir was just liquid yogurt. You know, I don't know why it didn't occur to me that it had to be different organisms culturing it or it would turn into yogurt. It would solidify the curd instead of being a liquid curd. So I recently did a lot of research on the kefir organisms and I found that these organisms actually, when you use kefir, they can actually recolonize your gut. The yogurt organisms do great things when you eat yogurt, but the yogurt organisms cannot recolonize your gut. It's the keep, and some of the keeper organisms are the same as the yogurt organisms, but there's some different ones. The keeper organisms use um, an organism called leuconostoc, and there's actually, I believe, there's a yeast, a strain of yeast, two strains of yeast in your keeper organisms. Yeah, and the nice thing, don't get all panicked and go, oh, I have systemic yeast or I have yeast infection. These organisms of yeast are actually the ones that keep candida, that strain of yeast, in check. Just like the good bacteria that's in your yogurt keeps pathogenic streptococcus food poisoning organisms in check. So, you know, people can't quite get a handle on that, that yeast is not yeast is not yeast. Yeast is a is a family of organisms and there's these certain strains that just like the lactobacillus bacteria keeps streptococcus and those types of organisms in check so do these different strains of yeast keep your stick candida in check so um, kefir is a great great drink um, and and product to use so all you're going to do with your kefir starter i'm a little shy on my milk there but that it's a quart um, we sell the starters in packages like this, and it's one package per quart of milk. So, and all you do is you take your refrigerated milk, your cold milk, stir your package in, let it sit on your counter overnight. And I usually do cover it, but Caleb was, like he was saying, put cheesecloth over it. And um, just let it sit room temperature overnight. Uh, the first time you do it, it'll take about 24 hours. After that, um, like if you saw, now to culture this, instead of using this package, I can use some of my kefir that we cultured yesterday to culture my next quart. And it'll take about two tablespoons per quart to culture your next one. And so what I usually do is when I've got this made, I take two tablespoons out before I refrigerate it and then pour my milk and then I refrigerate this one while that one's culturing. So I'm using, and then before I, the next morning, I just, do the same again and I've just constantly got kefir going in my refrigerator and you can see however expensive your gallon of milk is I pay four dollars a gallon for milk so it's a dollar a quart for kefir and you can do this using this or using your subsequent batches of kefir as your next culture up to seven times seven generations the cool thing about this this starter you can ferment juice you can ferment soy milk, coconut milk, almond milk, 
June, yes, these, these organisms, this starter will ferment, and I'm telling you, grape juice fermented with this is unbelievable. Herbal tea, goat milk, yes, it'll ferment, okay? It's got to have a little sweetener there, like your almond milk. Is that right, Caleb? It's got to have a little honey, or not honey. Can't use honey. Can't use honey because honey is actually antibacterial, so it'll kind of keep those things from growing. So um, just use like agave or um, sucanat or sucanat with honey. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, forget I said anything. Okay, I'm sorry, I've got to get back to my milk. It's just boiling, just about to boil. Actually, okay, ignore that. Um, you want it to just where it's bubbling around the edges. You want to get it hot, and then you want to let it cool down to 115 degrees, and then we're going to add our yogurt starter to here. Okay? But getting back to my kefir, someone had a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yes, probably so, but the same with buttermilk. But it's cheaper for me to make the kefir. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. you'll, kick, you'll kill off some of those organisms. Some of them can withstand cooking. Some of your kefir organisms can, can handle the heat okay. Because um, you've got to understand, the in, though you're baking at 400 or th like 350 on that bread, the internal temperature of the bread only got to 175. You see what I'm saying? So though you've got it in that oven hot, the internal temperature never gets that hot. So some of those organisms will still stay alive. So I just love, and I'm telling you, it makes the fluffiest waffles and pancakes and muffins even fluffier than the, than the um, buttermilk. And for me, I just have it around all the time. And it's so easy to make. Why? And a lot of times you can't find buttermilk. So, Yeah, you're going to use it just like you would buttermilk. It still, you, you know, it takes the, the acid because it's now acidifying. See, your organisms produce lactic acid. Yes. I'm sorry, what? Yes, and that's what I think Caleb's going to do for you. He's just really wanting to do this yogurt. Yes? Um, what would happen if you put the culture in the yogurt now? It's too hot. It's boiling. It's 212. So that would kill your organism. So you want to scald it to, to kill any bacteria that's in there that would make this milk rot instead of culture. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you're kind of like sterilizing it so you can put the organisms in there that you want. And um, a faster way to cool this down, um, I'm going to use the, this and this. Oh, do we not have anything else? I wasn't planning on, uh, well, hey, here's mixed fruit. That's good. Oh, look. Sorry, we're just scrounging over here for stuff to make smoothies with. That looks fine. Oops. You going to use dates? Yes. Okay. Can you deal with that? <laughs> um, the shelf life of the keeper. Um, Okay, he's saying two weeks on the live organisms, but the milk itself, I mean, it's already rotten. <laughs> okay, he's got some that he's still using that's a couple of months old. So it, as far as spoiling or hurting you, it's not going to hurt you to be in there for quite a while. It's just that's about how long the, the organisms will be viable without feeding them. You see what I'm saying? They'll eat up, they'll use up all the food. So um, anyway, yes, ma'am. Um, um, the key, With the keeper or the yogurt? Okay, the keeper, you can ferment anything. That's why I'm saying fruit juice, herbal tea, coconut milk, almond milk, soy milk, rice milk. Oh, right. Pasteurized and...
you get me some ice in here about that much? Water? Yeah, I can do that here. Okay, what Caleb is saying is... <laughs> Hello. Um, on fermenting the, making the kefir with juice, he and I both have found the grape juice works the best. Um, I've not had success with the clear juices like apple juice. We even tried a tart cherry, and that didn't seem to work very well. The grape juice worked very, very well. The herbal tea worked very well. Um, I don't know if it had to do with the sugar content. It was a sweetened herbal tea. We had tea left over after a class, and we decided, hey, let's see. Oh, my goodness. And it was, the, I think it was the wild strawberry. It tasted like a strawberry soda. It, it bubbles. It, carb, it naturally carbonates it and ferments it. It is very, very delicious. I'm sorry I for, didn't think about making y'all some of that today. Very mildly, 0.01%. I mean, just very, very, very mildly alcoholic. I believe, personally, that naturally fermented grape juice is probably what is referred to as wine in the Bible. You know, when Paul tells Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach, um, you know, and that fermenting those, those fruits and, and the juice, that was, again, preservation. That's why I lumped all these things in this class, even yogurt making and kefir making. Preservation. A cow gives about eight gallons of milk a day. A goat is one or two, I think. I don't remember now. what. That's a lot of milk when you have herds, pastures. Uh, you know, what are you going to do with all that without putting it in the refrigerator? Well, they cleaned the gut, and they poured it in those skins, and those were their bags, and they cultured it, naturally cultured that milk, and that was their way of, um, of preserving that milk. And then I believe also it was their antibiotics their way of staying healthy and uh, whether they knew it or not. What I'm doing here is I'm going to try to um, quick cool this down. How bad am I doing? Okay. Century, they used to make ale, uh, which mm -hmm. is a very mildly alcoholic drink, and even the children would drink it because it was safer than drinking the water. Oh, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, interesting, the, the grape juice and the tea and things like that, indefinite. You can just keep doing your next batch indefinitely. Um, a quart to a pack when you start, and then it's a quarter cup of the juice to do your next batch. And it's all, the directions are, are in the packet. You will love this. Your kids will love it. I mean, you, they really will. Yes. Yes, you can do. I'm not kidding. You can do. Yes. Yes, you can. All right. So I'm just going to cool my yogurt down here. I mean, my milk down. You want um, I'm taking it down to 115. So to speed the process along here of cooling it down, I've just put it in an ice bath. Now, one word of caution here on your making your yogurt. You don't want to cool this below 115. I did that one time and I thought, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll just, add. no. The, the incubators there, they don't really, they're not hot enough that they really warm the milk back up. And the yogurt organisms like at least 115 degrees. So you don't want to get this cold. If you do, if you forget it and go off and come back and it's, you know, 98 or, uh, you know, 75, whatever, then just warm it slightly back up to 115 before you put your culture in. Yes? Mm -hmm. It's the acid in, in there um, reacting with the soda in your recipes. Um, actually, did, did you like the biscuits this morning? Um, that whipping cream biscuit recipe is the best I've ever had. Um, and you can just, the, the recipe is there, um, and then it, just the addition for the orange is it right below it. That was a, a Paula Dean recipe with self-rising flour, and we just converted it 
No, you don't cut in any butter or anything. Just use the whipping cream as both the liquid and the fat. They're amazing. That's the best. I think biscuits are the hardest thing for those of us milling, particularly Southerners. I mean, we're just so used to that white lily, you know, self-rising flour. Okay, I'm at 115 here, so I want to get my um, culture. Okay, go ahead. Well, tell me when you're done. And what Caleb has discovered using for the sweetener, are you having a blender moment over there? Um, Caleb is my uh, inventive and creative and he's gonna try anything. Um, he tried using dates. Dates are so wonderful. They're so high in fiber, they're so high in potassium and they're so naturally sweet. So he sweetened the um, smoothie with dates instead of even honey or agave nectar or anything. So it gives you great fiber. Um, I don't know that I've, dates don't grow in this country, do they? Maybe in Florida? Um, Cal yeah, California, I guess they do. I've never seen dates that weren't dried already. I wonder if they spoil very, like figs, spoil so quickly. I mean, I even put mine in the refrigerator. Two days later, they were, they were gone. They were already spoiled. Um, so I just, I just don't know. But our dates, oh my goodness, the dates we sell, the best dates I've ever. I just, if I want something sweet, I'll just eat one or two. And, then, and you just did 14 grams of fiber <laughs> in two dates. I, I, believe it's, I believe it's seven. I might be wrong there. It might be a little less than that. But it's a lot. Real high in potassium. So, okay, I need to put my starter in here. We sell a yogurt starter. You, and it tells you, I think it's a quarter teaspoon for um, a quart of milk, and you just sprinkle it in and stir it in. That's pretty self-explanatory, so I thought I would show you how to use yogurt as your starter. You're just gonna do, I actually, to be honest with you, I usually just buy like a one cup container, and I'll do um, like half of it. So I usually do two or three tablespoons of the yogurt, and that's where you do want to look at your code date on the yogurt because that code date guarantees that the, organ that the bacteria, the culture is alive. So if you have an old container of yogurt in there, um, it's not gonna, not gonna work. So what you wanna do if you're gonna use yogurt, I'm sorry, this had some dip in there, <laughs> that roasted red pepper. Yes, you got to get a good yogurt, okay? And always do plain, always do plain yogurt. Always use plain yogurt. And here's what you want to do. Almost like making gravy, you want to put a little bit of milk with these two or three tablespoons of yogurt and make a nice smooth paste out of it. If you put your two or three tablespoons of yogurt right into here, when you try to stir it in, it's just going to, the yogurt's just going to separate and clump. It's not going to go into um, mixture very well. So you want to just add a little bit of milk, make the paste, the smooth paste. Now you know that you're going to get all of the milk inoculated with that yogurt. All right? Now, all I'm going to do here, whatever yogurt maker I'm choosing to use, whether it be the Yo Life, which this is our favorite yogurt maker. It comes with seven jars, two lid options. If you use the little jars, which these are wonderful, then what you would do is just pour this evenly in your jars, they're glass, and then just put them in, plug it in, and that incubates it. And if you put it in, it's usually about 12 hours to incubate, so if you put it in at 
one o'clock today, then you know you're going to take it at one o'clock tomorrow. So that just tells you when to take it. Or not one o'clock, I'm sorry, one o'clock in the morning. So um, I usually do my yogurt again. I do it at night before I go to bed or and then take it out in the morning or I do it in the morning, put it in the refrigerator before I go to bed. It just depends on what I need. So this is a nice yogurt maker. The other option, it comes with this extra lid, this dome lid, so that if you want to, you don't have to use these jars at all. And you can, you know what, I better take this out of here. It's still getting cold. Huh? Can I finish this real quick? Um, now what I can do is I can pour this into quart jars and it'll actually hold three quart jars and I use the big lid. So you can do three quarts at a time. Or you could put a bowl in there. Um, so that's, that's the nice thing about this dehydrator. I mean, uh, yogurt maker. That's the Dombier is the original yogurt maker that we started with. That has a timer that'll turn itself off, but it only comes with the jars. Um, we sell another one, the Euro Cuisine, comes with the jars and comes with optional adding a second layer. Um, but since this is a dehydration class, if you're getting a dehydrator, why not just fill these quart jars with your yogurt starter and put them in the dehydrator? There's a yogurt setting. It's 115 degrees. So either one of them, you can just you just take your trays out and you can do, oh my goodness, you could do... If you're, yes, you just put the jar in there, I've, since I've got this running. You can put a lot of jars in here at one time. I mean, if you took out all the trays, you could put half gallon jars, stand them up in there. So you could, wow, what? give that child some smoothie. Um, okay. <laughs> hey, Caleb, finish your smoothie over there. Um, but anyway, so that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to make a Shrek smoothie, so just, <laughs> all right, so now that, I did a quart of milk, and I really needed another quart there. You used all my milk there. Ah. And I do put a lid on this, or it'll actually dehydrate it <laughs> on the top, which is fine. Um, anyway, so just put the quart jar in um, the dehydrator or in the yogurt maker or whatever, and there you have it. That's it, all right? I'm going to make the Shrek smoothie, the pineapple, banana, a little orange juice, and a couple of tablespoons of the spinach powder for you. We'll serve the, um, yeah, that we let overcool. We're going to serve the garden harvest bread, and Caleb will serve your smoothie over there, all right? It's about 10 to 12 hours. It's because it's you're going to turn the temperature down to 115 degrees. So anyway, either one of these dehydrators are great, great dehydrators. One other thing about that dehydrator, oh, I think I told you that, that it, it really adjusts um, and is very precise on the temperature of that dehydrator, okay? Yes. All right, so I'm going to make a smoothie ooh, with my mega blender here. And I'm going to use um, frozen pineapple, frozen banana, a little bit of orange juice, and my spinach powder. One day I got kind of creative and wanted to see if, um, if I could use dehydrated, dehydrated fruit, um, pineapple, and bananas to make my smoothie, and it actually worked. So you could even throw dehydrated, you put some ice in there. But yes, ma'am. Um, that's a different starter. I don't really know. Um, I know I've used yogurt that I made to start my next batch. I just, I don't know how, kind of lose track. Yes. Wouldn't be, I, I don't know. I don't know. Why would the keeper not be indefinite? I don't know why the keeper's not indefinite. I don't know. Oh, okay. It's it's because you're using a fermented, and then you're going to just start getting more and more fermented taste in your in your food, I guess. Um, the yogurt. Uh, that's a good question because someone asked me about can you use low fat, no fat, whatever kind of milk. I find that the um, if there's not a lot of fat or protein, if it's a skim milk, that a lot of times the yogurt will be a little runny. A um, couple of things you can do there. You can either add dry milk powder 
you know, a little powder to the, the milk when you're heating it and just stir it in. That will make a really thick yogurt. Another thing Ashley uses is she uses the um, Panoma pectin and just adds a little bit of pectin and that'll thicken up and make the yogurt very nice, very nice. Um, but I use whole milk for pet use only milk, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so um, anyway, and it, it's wonderful, wonderful yogurt and kefir. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, to make Greek yogurt, you just you strain it. And you, we now have cheesecloth, so you can either, if you want to do a lot, like um, my, our olive oil salesman, he was in here the other day and saw my little yogurt strainer container. You know what I'm talking about? Now, I will tell you, I haven't had great success straining my homemade yogurt. I don't know why. It just doesn't seem to... It has to be, okay, that's what it is, then it has to be the full milk so that it's a thicker, heartier, or maybe if, if you don't use full milk, then you need to add the powder. But this is my strained yogurt. He was really intrigued with, with this, and he goes, well, in Greece, we have big sheets of cheesecloth, and you just put mountains of yogurt in the, over these big bowls, and you're straining the yogurt all the time. Tablecloths. In the, Yeah, in Greece, because they use so much yogurt. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. This was, um, this is a. Uh -huh. No way. Yes. Okay, the Shrek smoothie recipe is in your handout, but again, just don't be, you don't have to be exact with smoothies. How you doing there? You finished? Go ahead. <laughs> Tell you what, let's have dueling blenders going over here. using frozen fruit for my smoothies. You don't have to, of course. You can use fresh fruit and ice. Yeah. Yeah, it's right there. What's your name? Are you done with this? It's got milk in it. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, spinach powder. I'm tripling this recipe, so I'm going to use three tablespoons. We just put a cup of spinach in. Does it say, call for honey? No. Okay. Ooh. Okay. All of a sudden I thought, that said a half a tablespoon of spinach. be more like ice cream. little cups and a spoon and I think the easiest is going to be just to spoon it and put it in a cup at the same time use their spoon that they're actually going to eat with oh man that is really 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 good wow I might leave this out and make another one okay I'm so glad y'all came today I hope you learned something any more questions yes um, 
You would. I would probably soak it in the pineapple, just, I mean, in the orange juice, just a little bit, or you're going to have to use a little more liquid there because it'll kind of soak that up. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you for, yes? Um, it's, it's in, if you buy the yogurt makers, directions are in there. And so is, I think there's even directions in the Excalibur dehydrator. So um, it's, it's there. And basically, I mean, that's, uh oh, wow. That's all it is, is just to heat the milk. I think it's going to be easier just to, oops. I don't know. Yep, okay. Y'all want to just come up and get these? You want to do this? Thank you for coming today. Oh, okay, Chad, for those of you that pick up milk, is at the lower warehouse today because there's so many cars in our parking lot.